This is the segment organized by SCS and E2I on career mentoring. And today's topic is about developing the next generation of software developers. So I just heard a very loud thunder. I hope you didn't, you didn't hear that. Yeah. One second. Right, uh, before we start, I think I need to inform all the viewers that uh, this webinar will be recorded. And uh, by participating in this webinar, you consent to the recording and its reproductions to be used uh, for broadcast and all promotional purposes uh, by the Singapore Computer Society and its representatives, uh, deemed fit for its use. And uh, the event does not follow or does not allow an authorized recording by any third party, so do not worry about that. And uh, by attending the event, you agreed not to uh, record or uh, digitize part of this uh, presentation. Right. Thank you very much, Lou. And uh, to ensure the smooth running of today's session, uh, may I request that everyone mute your mic. Uh, if you have questions that you would like to ask, uh, we have a chat section that you can post a chat there. And uh, there's a dedicated Q&A panel uh, sessions later after all the three talks, and we're going to that uh, and answer your questions. And uh, we do encourage you to uh, verbalize your questions then uh, or, or use the chat uh, function, right? Okay. Uh, first, Uh, I'm Tech Chun, I'm the host today. So I'm uh, part of DataSpark of NCS Group. In my day job, I manage the engineering team under DataSpark. And some context for today's session as well. As you know, this is about software engineering and it's uh, associated discipline. So I have actually two contexts to share uh, in terms of uh, setting the tone for today's discussion. One is about they are both around topics around software. I think uh, if you've seen this post, this post is around 11 years ago, 2011. And uh, Mark Edison is the inventor on the uh, Netscape uh, browser, if you remember. And he said, uh, software is eating the world, right? That's 11 years ago. And 11 years forward, I think today we got a lot more platforms play, a lot of the uh, e-commerce players. And you can see the vibrant digital ecosystem. And indeed, software is eating the way. Right? Everything that we touch and use today goes through a software interface. And uh, who are the people building all this software? It's the software engineers. right? And uh, what does it mean then with all this need for digital services and software engineering? right? At least in Singapore, this means that uh, we are going to pay a lot more higher to hire to to hire talents and also retain talents, right? This is a very recent report, twenty fourth of February. Uh, tax salaries are, are expected to jump twenty two percent. In chase for very skilled coders. So you we will also have seen a similar report in Straits Times recently about uh tech salaries rising, right? And so this is specifically for software engineers, right? So some good news to share. Right? And this is to set the context of uh, software engineering see, uh, for today's discussion. And this will be the program for today. Um, later on, I welcome Pacey from E2i to share what's E2i and then follow up with uh, introduction of the three speakers and each of them will share a topic uh, of a of their passion and also a, a team around their journey. And after that, there'll be a Q and A. There will also be a breakout session for group mentoring and where the three speakers will be in individual rooms. And we will take questions and uh, answers in those sessions as well. If you are not comfortable with asking them in the Q and A, right? And, they, and then we will close around 5.20 and uh, end at 5.30. And without further ado, let me introduce Pacey uh, to introduce e to y over to you, Pacey. Thank you. Give me a while, let me just share my screen.
Okay, so we just technical check. Are you able to see my slides? Everything is good? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Hello, I am Pei from E2I. We actually uh, means Employment and Employability Institute. As our name suggests, uh, our key focus is actually helping our Singaporeans as well as PRs to look for jobs. That is where we are looking at employment. And of course, we are looking at training, which translates back to employability. Okay, an overview of E2I, we are actually under the NTUC, the labor movements, and we actually work very closely with the various government agencies such as WSG, SSG, SNAP, Singapore Labor Foundations to create better solutions for our local workers in terms of you know, job placement as well as uh, complementary training for our citizens. The three block services that I'm going to share with you today uh, is with regards to career guidance. If, for instance, uh, anyone of you today, you know, you, you would like to have someone to talk to you, some, a professional a career coach talk to you for about you know, 30 to about 40 minutes on your career aspirations, you know, or to explore the various uh, career pathway or the various uh, training available or even the various government uh, resources available, do talk to us. I will, uh, I will share a little bit more on this in my later slides. Other than career guidance, where you will be able to meet career coaches, we also have skills upgrading. Um, this skills upgrading typically is when after you have met our career coach and then, you know, um, if you deem that, you know, you would like to look at, you know, how you want to, um, look at improving your employability, such as um, your resume, writing skills. Um, you want to look at CV critics. You want to look at, you know, how you can pick out some tips during your interview, how to negotiate salaries, et cetera. This, we have various uh, courses on skills upgrading available for you. And most of this course are actually complementary as well. Okay, and of course, the last part that we have is actually on job matching. You know, once you have spoken to our career coach, once you know where you want to, uh, which jobs you want to apply for, when you have more clarity on your career directions, we will actually organize various platforms that, you know, you can potentially tap on from career fairs, virtual career fairs, networking sessions that you can attend to potentially find yourself a job with a company. Okay, so we go back to the first point about in the uh, career coaching uh, services in I. Um, uh, because of the COVID situations, we will encourage um, everyone to meet an e-appointment to meet our career coach. Right now, the de facto uh, mode is actually via a phone coaching or it could be via um, you know, virtual uh, coaching. But should you prefer to do on-site uh, coaching, uh, do let us know as well. Uh, well, you go for your career coaching. This will be actually on a one-to-one -one, uh, career talk with a coach, and they will guide you on your career journey from improving your resumes, defining your career goals, identifying your employability gaps to matching you to these jobs, uh, to the various jobs available. In terms of skills upgrading, we also help locals to see for employment. We have various uh, workshops as well as webinars to aid you in terms of your job search. So some of this is, uh, includes the half-day series of the Win the Job series. So every uh, it is about three to four hours where they will touch on three various topics, including Win the Search, Win the Interview, as well as Win the Salary Negotiations. So during these workshops, there could be certain uh, you know, um, hands-on, there could be certain um, uh, uh, scenarios where you, know, you, you, you can then better you know, um, practice your skills in terms of these uh, you know, interview skills, in terms of your CV, et cetera. Uh, on top of this, um, we also have other uh, webinars such as Career Navigators, if, for instance, you want to um, better understand yourself, your personality, and how this relates back to your um, job opportunities, uh, then career navigators will be for you. So under these career navigators, there will be a career profiling tools that you can use to better understand yourself. Uh, then next, we also have, of course, job hunting online. How do you search for jobs online, as well as networking yourself to success? Okay, so um, for... On our site, a lot of our events are being listed on our E2Y website at e2y.com.sg slash events. So every month, you will be able to see the various events such as career fairs, training previews, um, job career fair, networking sessions, etc. All this, all this will then be listed. So uh, do uh, look at our website uh, you know, frequently to, to know what are the upcoming events that we have for you.
Okay, and then the other thing is that um, we also have two Telegram channels uh, for job seekers who are looking for jobs. We post jobs very regularly onto, onto these two channels, one channel for PMET roles and the other channel for your non-PMET roles. So these roles are actually across the various sectors, including tech roles. And if, for instance, you are keen in any of these job roles, you can just create a profile and then apply via the Telegram. It's actually a very simple job application itself. Then uh, on top of that, um, if for instance, you are looking at you know, non-executive um, job role, uh, we also have these um, app apps, which is Find Job Apps. It's actually the first non-executive jobs uh, marketplace applications where you know, the jobs are then uh, in the four um, key languages in Singapore, English, Mass, Chinese, uh, sorry, Chinese, Malay, Indian, and English. Okay. And then uh, I also wanted to share with you what are some of the various programs under the SG United that the government has actually rolled out during this uh, COVID pandemic. Um, so these various programs aims to help about 100,000 Singaporeans uh, to pick up training as well as career uh, during this pandemic pe uh, period. The first program that we have is actually the SG United Job Initiative. This is where uh, jobs are then created under the Adapt and Grow uh, Place and Train Career Conversion Program to place our locals into um, entry-level roles itself. Next, uh, if for instance you are looking at a career switch, maybe in a tech position, we have the we have this SG United Mid Career Pathway Program. It's actually meant for four thousand new traineeships uh, for mid career unemployed individuals in uh, hiring roles such as tech, uh, media, etc. So if you're looking at mid-career uh, transitions, training is actually provided for you. And while you're in the program, you will also be paid a training allowance as well. Next, we have the SG United Skills Program, where if, for instance, you are not so ready to look for a job right now, you want to uh, focus on you know, upskilling yourself in specific industry sector uh, skill sets, you can take on this SG United Skills Program. Uh, the, the training is about six to nine months with the various uh, training providers as well as Institute of Higher Learning. And of course, the last but not least, we have the SG United Traineeship Programs uh, for graduates. Huh? Okay, so in summary, um, E2I do work with us to augment your employability through our various resources to discover a unique career path that works best for your career uh, pro uh, fulfillment itself. We have career guidance through our career coaching. We have skills upgrading through the various um, complementary webinars to look at, you know, to skill up your employability skill sets. And of course, we have various platforms and events to match you with our networks of employers. Uh, that's about all I have for you today. Uh, if you would like to find out more about E2I, do scan the QR code over here. Thank you. Thank you, Pacey, for sharing. And uh, let me switch over back to the slides again. Okay, I hope you can see. Okay, and uh, for our first speaker today, uh, we'll welcome Hendrik, and uh, Hendrik is the Director of Software Engineering at NCS Group, and his journey started at age 14, and his first uh, Hello World was written in Dolan C, right, during a recruitment boot camp, right, organized by uh, the school's computer society, and he has picked up more than 10 programming languages spontaneously, and uh, considered himself a hardcore programmer, right? and he's also witnessed the agile adoption and transformation in, in, in software development journey. And he is now doing that as well, incorporating Agile, UX, security, DevOps, product design practices. Right. So uh, let's welcome uh, Kendrick to talk about his journey. And um, over to you, Kendrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Tekchun. Yeah, let me share my screen uh, quickly. Yeah. Okay, can you all see my screen, uh, my, my slides in full screen? Yep. Yes, yes. All right, okay. So, so into, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Kendrick, I'm from NCS. Uh, yeah, so uh, today I just uh, quickly go through because I've given uh, 20 minutes. So I'm um, talking uh, 
uh, introducing about myself and why join uh, as a software developer and uh, what are the good traits and skill uh, for, for a software developer uh, and also uh, sharing about the career opportunities. I think that's a now state and also the upcoming trend. Uh. Anyway, this is uh, all, my, uh, all my view, yeah. Okay, so uh, for me, actually, um, just now that Chun has already shared, uh, that was during my secondary school where I have a hands-on experience as a software developer. So in fact, my first touch with the technology, like computing technology, started all the way back <coughs> uh, in primary one. So because of my headmaster of my primary school actually conducted these uh, typing courses uh, using computer. So I actually uh, enrolled and also started learning typing. So of course, during that time, I was dealing with Intel 286 CPU and maybe with one megabyte of RAM, maybe that's a quite antique already, right? And also with you dealing with the monochrome monitor, right? So that's a how antique the thing is. So I think it's, an, it's a good eye opener for me, uh, even though I was doing typing and sometimes uh, playing a lot of the primitive uh, DOS uh, games uh, in the past. So, so, so I think that actually, uh, I grow in, uh, actually I grew interest in the computing because of this. So uh, that's why when I was in the secondary school, when the computer society was organizing boot camp, I actually enrolled uh, and also started my C programming, C++ programming uh, from that time. And also uh, after I joined the computer society, I also picked up uh, Pascal uh, basic uh, assembly language myself uh, before going to the uh, NTU later, right? So, so anyway, that's all before my career journey. So um, yeah, so I think talking about my uh, career journey, I joined AMD as a software engineer, right? So during the time, uh, it was quite pri privileged to join uh, uh, AMD because I like PC a lot than uh, Intel and AMD, uh, these are the rivals. Uh, so, so I'm really happy to join AMD uh, as a software engineer. So um, I think, after I joined, uh, I picked up a, a lot more languages because I think different projects have uh, different requirements and different programming languages have this uh, advantage uh, uh, comparing to the others. So, so I, I, I think as, I'm, as I work uh, as a software engineer, I pick up more languages by myself. So uh, I was maybe when I was in secondary school, when the internet was not so popular, right? So we have to rely on the books itself. Uh, even have to ask questions to our seniors, how to solve programming problems and so on. But now with the internet, everything is different. So I still re uh, remember in 1995, the email just started and someone shared with me how wonderful email technology is, right? So, so maybe nowadays it's like a given thing, the, the, the email. So the technology has advanced and changed uh, everyone's life, right? So, um, so as a software engineer, I have to deal with the multiple languages, programming languages itself, because of different business has a different needs. Uh, so for example, if you want performance, you, you may want to go for C++, then you have to you know, deal with certain assembly lines and to talk to the CPU uh, directly, you know, so to, to actually uh, ensure efficiency in your coding. Yeah, but now as a computing, uh, uh, power right has become cheaper, so maybe a lot of the focus actually shifted to the user experience rather than just the performance. Of course, of course, the performance is still important. It's just that uh, the computing cost is now cheaper. Maybe now people focus more on the user experience of the product that you deliver. Okay, uh, fast forward to two thousand and six. I think that's a point of time the thing get interesting. Uh, because my counterpart in the US they started the uh, agile journey. Uh, so they pretty much want uh, everyone to uh, adopt Agile. So that's how my Scrum journey started and my role changed to a uh, Scrum Master. So uh, when I try to uh, use the laser pointer. Yeah, so after that, uh, I was uh, promoted to a product team lead for Sony console product, PS4 and Microsoft uh, Xbox One as a product team lead. Uh, I think that was also an exciting time that we managed to release uh, these two wonderful products uh, from AMD uh, because supporting both Sony and Microsoft. Uh, but during the time, I was actually playing dual role, uh, being a team lead and also a scrum master itself. Uh, after that, I decided to move on to focus more towards Agile. As you can see, in 2013, I joined IDA. 
is an HR consultant. Uh, after I joined uh, IDA uh, government, uh, I also played different roles, uh, being a product owner or product managers in a scrum role itself uh, in the government uh, context, right? playing multiple roles. Um, so, so I think that's my uh, more focused uh, agile journey started. After that, I think in the 2000, 2016, the, actually the IDA sort of a reform and a form of Gov tech, right? So I actually more focusing on agile coach, uh, giving a, a advocacy, uh, advocacy services to uh, multiple government agencies, and also focusing on the engineering lead role for product development lifecycle. So I think as uh, Petron mentioned, have to take care of the UX, uh, for the DevOps, uh, security, all these things comes into the play for software uh, product development, right? So it's all, all, all of these are very important uh, as part of the engineering design for a successful product. So we have to take care of all different uh, aspects of the thing. Uh, after that, 2018, I joined a, a SME company and it's a product-based company as a head of engineering. Uh, so, so I think the... Uh, there are two uh, departments, software and hardware engineering departments uh, reporting to me. I was reporting to CEO to try to uh, handle the needs for uh, like energy sector, uh, constructions, uh, construction sectors needs uh, for, their, for their products. So uh, last year I joined NCS, uh, being a practice lead for software engineering, also a director. So now trying to take care of uh, 750 people uh, in my department, trying to nurture the young uh, generation software developer, equip them with the, uh, with the right knowledge, as well as the right skill set for them to succeed uh, in the future. Yeah, so that's a quick one about my journey. Yeah, so, so actually I, I show this picture, uh, this picture was taken from uh, uh, Niagara Falls. So, so actually I quite enjoy the scenery from multiple angles. So, 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 so I think that's why uh, having different perspective on the same thing is very important so that you can really differentiate or, or maybe different, really uh, appreciate the, the, the multiple uh, perspective. You can uh, see things from different angles, then that will widen your view. Yeah. Okay, so uh, first question, right? Why join as a software developer? Because it's fun, right? So um, a lot of people may think that software developer is quite uh, busy, quite boring, but it's in fact, if you're actually in the industry for long enough, it's not the case. Why? It's first point is about meaningful and purposeful. So it's not something like, oh, your project manager throw you a bunch of uh, agreement, you just code accordingly like a machine. No, because in the nowadays, the software world is, we are trying to solve a real problem, right? So uh, I still re recall uh, I joined a project in the GovTech uh, in collaboration with SCDF uh, talking about uh, my responder uh, app. So for example, if someone uh, having a cardiac arrest you know, in a shopping mall, so how you can actually uh, alert the nearby uh, responder to come to rescue these people. So we are using tech solution, uh, using cloud technologies and everything. So we eventually roll out this product. So in, and it also successfully uh, rescue lives of, of the people. So that's why I see this is a very uh, meaningful uh, project or product. Right? So it's really solving problem, uh, saving lives. So that's, that's why it's very meaningful. So it, it depends on where you are, uh, which industry you enjoy. There's a different problems. Maybe may not be that significantly meaningful like saving life, but there are other 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 examples uh, that you can solve a problem. Uh, then you feel satisfaction out of it. Okay. Secondly, challenging, right? So when trying to solve a problem, it's not just uh, just a single way of solving the problem because when you're trying to solve a problem, you have to be creative. You have to be innovative. Uh, you have to have uh, some innovative thinking uh, in your solution. So how, how people feel like, oh yeah, your software de delivered is very easy to use, user-friendly uh, and so on. So we have to be uh, able to think out of the box, maybe think from the user perspective, uh, from the business perspective, uh, are, 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 are we addressing the issues? 
So it's actually very challenging as well. So it's not like, oh, I just follow the instruction given my boss or my, given by my client and just quote accordingly. No, it's not the case, right? Yeah, Last, lastly, uh, it's really interesting, right? It's actually an art. Why, why I say it's an art? Because art never finished. So for a uh, single painting, right? You can always paint multiple times. You can further refine and refine and refine. It's still the same painting, right? So I think same goes to the software. So, so for the software, right? If you really want to deliver a uh, successful software, uh, there's a lot of things to consider. So for example, if a client gives you the, the budget to build a Honda car, for example, right? So you cannot go to the extreme and use a technique to build a Ferrari per se, right? You'll be running out of budget, running out of time. And so on. you have to be realistic, right? So, and also how to make the client happy and also like uh, have the satisfaction from the, from the customer for, uh, for example. So, so we have to balance out all these factors. Uh, like there's a moving part, like you have budget, you have time, you have resource, and you also have to think about a creative, uh, innovative uh, way of solving the problem and deliver and uh, delight the customers. So it's actually an art and you can also uh, do the product development over and over again to further and further refine the product. So that, uh, so that's why it's an art itself. So it, that's why it's very interesting. Okay, so I think the, this for the first part. Yeah, second part, uh, software developer is a progressive career, right? So if you are uh, ambitious enough, right? You can start from a software engineer, go all the way up to manager, director, or even CEO one day. But right. there's no stopping you from uh, further progressing yourself as long as you pick up the right skills and experience and you advance your career, right? So uh, second point about rewarding. Yes, I think uh, Techtron has already mentioned. I mean, just to be, uh, just to share with you all, I think right now, this year, the, the graduate from university, right, joining as a software developer, the starting pay uh, was actually double of what I got my first salary uh, 20 years ago. So it's actually very rewarding and the starting pay keep on increasing for the IT sector. So that's why it's very rewarding. Uh, third point about job security. So maybe you have heard about uh, AI replacing the jobs. So for example, maybe a lot of people think that, oh, once I retire, I may uh, take up uh, the cleaning under job, not trying to clean uh, the places. But maybe for myself, 20 years later, if I want to retire, I may not be able to find a job as a cleaning anchor because it may be all uh, be replaced by robots, cleaning robots and so on. So, so a lot of the jobs are slowly being replaced by AI. Uh, for example, even for great driver, now we are talking about autonomous driving, right? So a lot of the drivers, maybe in 10, 20 years later, no job already, right? So, but for IT, uh, I, hope, I, I don't think the, the developers are that easy to be replaced by AI, the artificial intelligence. So uh, I also heard about one uh, case whereby my friend's uh, daughter, right? So uh, going to choose the faculty in university and uh, she almost chose law. Uh, yeah, but I think there was some advice given to her saying that maybe 10, 10 20 years later, uh, this law faculty may not, may be replaced by AI and the, and the risk is really there. So she eventually chose another faculty. Uh, yeah, so, so these are all examples. Uh, the technology is uh, changing the world and, the, and also the COVID is uh, simply pushing the digital transformation uh, forward. And I think in the next 20 years, the changes uh, are going to be uh, increasingly uh, faster. Okay, um, the third point, Right. So as a software developer, I think there are, there are some other advantages also, because when you started your career as a software developer, you can change your role to different types. So for example, you can remain as a technical, you can become an architect, you can become a, a great software developer that can code all the way up. Right. So if you are getting tired of it and you think that this is not for you for a long, long run, you may go to consulting, you may try to uh, give consultation for your clients, uh, providing them the services. Uh, third one, managerial, you can become manager, directors, you know, try to uh, do something uh, for your company, uh, admin as well. I think the, the role type, actually you can switch. Yeah. Uh, the next point about industry and sectors, IT is actually, uh, 
IT role uh, actually exists in almost all kinds of company across all industries and all sectors. So public services, a lot of fintech, healthcare, media, telco, yeah, all have IT, even Ninja then, right? So they also have IT and they are keep on increasing their investment uh, in the IT itself to uh, provide a better service uh, to, the, to their clients. Yeah, so um, another, another thing is um, for IT company, they are also SI company, software integrator, and also product based. Um, I'm just saying, I, I think for, for software developer, there's a lot of freedom to choose. You can switch, you can change your role. So for example, if you don't want to uh, continue with a soft, as a software engineer, you may change it, uh, change your role to become a project manager, product manager, scrum master, or even, even a manager in the future, right? So, so uh, as you can see on the left side, uh, for NCS, for example, we have a career tracks uh, there are 12 uh, established career tracks and, uh, it, and the, our software developer will be able to shift their role to different uh, tracks and also to further progress their career. Okay, um, so having, uh, having talk, uh, talked about uh, why as a software developer, uh, I'm just trying to help you guys, uh, I mean, based on my experience, uh, what constitute uh, being a, software, a good software developer and also uh, what are the traits are uh, important? Uh, I mean, this is based on my uh, uh, life experience. Okay, um, first point is uh, learning never ends, right? In IT sector, technology advances uh, very fast. So for example, when I started uh, HTML 1.0 programming in 1998, it's uh, manually coded in the text form. So just one, two years later, everything gets automated. You just click here, click there, then the whole thing appear already. No one do manual coding, coding for HTML. Then maybe four years later, 2.0 standard comes out, came out already, right? And 3.0 came out another few years later. And sometimes even the programming languages are phased out. So for example, I'm not sure how many of you uh, heard about Pascal language, uh, maybe, Nowadays, uh, no people uh, talk about, mention this uh, anymore because it has been phased out. Uh, C has become C++ and now, nowadays, most people use C Sharp for their business development project, right? So, so it's something like every few years, uh, the technology will uh, refresh and you, or, or even evolve. So, so as a software developer, you are expected to learn for your life. It's not something like I learned law, 20 years ago, the law still remains the same, right? So, but software developer, because of the advancement of the technology, uh, it's very rapid. So we are expected to uh, continuously uh, learn for the whole life. So, and even for some times you need to unlearn some of the things because uh, for example, like Agile, uh, I was uh, introduced with the software development life cycle or even waterfall for a few months, uh, sorry, for a few years already. Suddenly, this agile came and said, "Oh no, you shouldn't this waterfall anymore." So there's a lot of reasons. So, so, so for me, I have to unlearn a lot of things and also pick up new things in and try to digest and uh, trying to rationalize the whole thing. And uh, I think most important, uh, most importantly, you need to know what is the fundamental concept behind every technology. So, for example, like what is cloud? So, what is a hybrid cloud? Uh, yeah, what is a microservices? So, so these are the fundamental uh, things that will, uh, that will be there. It's just that maybe the syntax difference for certain languages and so on. So, so once you master the concept uh, and also know the, the, the core of it, uh, then the rest of the thing is typically are just minor changes. Okay, uh, second point, uh, as a software developer, you need to be uh, constantly curious about what, uh, the, what are the new technologies are, right? So um, I think that will help because if you are not curious, if you're not picking up new things, maybe a few years later, you'll find yourself uh, less relevant to the industry itself. Yeah, so this, this is uh, another important uh, attribute. Third attribute is about whether you have uh, analytic skills. So when the problem comes to you, how you can scrutinize and even you know, uh, examine all the, all the facts and try to come up with a solution. I, I, I think this, is a life skill, right? So no matter which position you are, whether you are developer, architect, manager, director, or what, when the problem comes to you, you must always have this uh, analytical skill to solve problems. 
So, so this is uh, considered a very important skill uh, to, to uh, invest yourself. Okay, uh, fourth is about presentation, right? So a lot of people just uh, read the slides, uh, right? So if your slides are your presentation, who needs you, right? So presentation skills is very important uh, as a software developer because nowadays, uh, uh, no one works alone. alone. So even for a uh, product team, right? You need to uh, be able to articulate your thoughts and even to present to the team what's your idea, proposal, and so on. So, so this has become increasingly important uh, as a software developer throughout the lifetime. If you're unable to articulate your ideas, uh, even like share your proposal, uh, it's very hard for people to understand you or even uh, get the buy-in from the clients itself. Okay, and lastly, find your passion. It's very important. As I mentioned, there are so many roles uh, available as a software developer. Which part suits you? depending on your character and your preference. And sometimes it is your uh, personal needs, for, for example. So, so for myself, I actually switched my role to Agile like 10 years ago, right? So um, maybe 15 years ago, and I moved uh, very deep into that track. Yeah, because I found my passion helping people, helping the team to transform uh, to a better way of handling the project in an Agile manner, right? So because the passion actually drives you uh, more effectively. If, if you have a passion in programming, even though I ask you to, to do programming for 10 hours, you, you won't feel tired. You just enjoy doing programming and that will uh, last you for 10, 20 years without issue. But if you don't have a passion and if your character doesn't suit certain role, maybe you have to try out something new. Try a new role and see whether you'll find this is a whether you're happy or not, whether you're satisfied uh, with this role that you're doing or not, right? So keep on try, trying, I think, I, so when, especially when you're young, right? So please go and try different role and find the role that suits you and you'll find your own passion. I think that will help you to uh, uh, support your career for a very long time. This is very uh, important. Okay, um, yeah, so talking about uh, current career opportunity, of course, cloud is number one. It's very hot. Even for some of the bank, uh, they have a plan to like, switch to cloud uh, for the infrastructure 50% in, by 2023, right? So a lot of incumbents started to uh, adopt cloud technology, including uh, government, right? So, so this is, con uh, this is con going to be uh, a very hot. Uh, the uh, area for, for demand, right? Okay, the second part about full stack development. Um, in the past, maybe people more focusing just on one area. As you can see, there are three circles, right? They are only focusing on front end or back end or database. But the demand, maybe it's also because of the, the agile adoption. Uh, we want developers uh, with the cross-functional uh, capability. The full stack development becomes very important. Or, or the full stack developer, they need to have the skills uh, in all these three areas. So when you, once you have the all three area uh, skills, then you'll consider yourself a full stack developer. Right? So this is also very hot right now. Internet of things, more and more sensors are available. 5G are here to support the backend, right? So everything can be connected. Like even your car, even for in China, you talk, 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 talk about the, the bus uh, having all this uh, 5G connectivity and also able to uh, have an autonomous driving and so on. Uh, this, is, uh, this will continue to boom, right? Especially with the 5G uh, enablement. Everything gets connected, even your uh, 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 rice cooker, uh, microwave, all these things yeah, can be a smart version of it, right? So, so, so I think this is trying to, this, this will continue for the next uh, 20 years. Uh, this is my uh, es uh, uh, estimation, right? Next one is about blockchain. So blockchain is about serverless. We, we decentralize uh, all the service. I think in the past, we also always have a server uh, available, physical server in the server room, right? But blockchain uh, is actually the reverse. We are talking about without even having a centralized server. So all, all the computing device that can act as a server and they keep on exchanging the information and make sure whatever token, whatever information is always real and also up to date. 
So if you're talk, talking about Bitcoin and all these things, uh, they are all based on blockchain uh, technology. Right. Okay, so this is uh, will continue to boom, especially in the fintech sector. Um, for artificial intelligence, it's another broad topic because like, for example, uh, machine learning, uh, deep learning, all this, they are all, all fall under this uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Um, so, so I think this is this will continue to drive the IT sector for the next, maybe, I think th th this, this will be the future, yeah. So, so um, maybe the fear of uh, AI replacing the, the human works and so on, this threat will continue to be there. Okay, so um, I think this is my last slide for the upcoming trend. I think this is my personal prediction for the next 20 years uh, in the IT sector. So first one, no code, no code, right? So actually low code, no code, this one is already in the IT right now. Uh, maybe it's just a small percentage uh, at this point of time. But in 20 years time, uh, this is going to, to, to change. All right, so don't quote me. Anyway, this is my personal uh, prediction. Why? Because, uh, for example, when I started C programming in the, in the past, 20, uh, maybe 30 years ago, right? When I want to create a string, I have to calculate how many uh, letters in the, in the string itself. I have to allocate memory. I have to, uh, after I use the string, I have to uh, return the memory and so on to the operating system. That is very inefficient, right? But that was the technology uh, during that time. So what low code means that there's a set of uh, API for you to call so that you can achieve your business uh, objective uh, faster. So for example, if I use C Sharp to do this or business logic, I need uh, one week, but maybe using the low code platform, uh, there's a lot of uh, API available. You just call it, your job can be done within one day. So that is the, that's the difference. No code means that there's a set of uh, uh, UI uh, tools available. You just click here, click there with a standard template, you can get the job done, right? So. I think overall is to uh is the time to market how fast you can uh, release your product to the market. So so I think this trend will continue to to be there for big organizations trying to uh, release a product in in a faster fashion, uh and also with the limited uh, talent in the IT market. I, I think this will continue to to grow in the next twenty years. Um, secondly, for the internet of behavior, so it's actually an extension of internet of thing right? So you have so many sensors, but you have sensor, you have collected the data, you try to uh, make sense of it, right? So from data and become information and becomes knowledge, right? Eventually become wisdom, right? So I think that will, uh, I think what I'm trying to, trying to achieve here is to achieve some personalization uh, required by individual so, so that the, the business know how to deliver their service to you. So currently right now, uh, when talking about commercial product, they just say, oh, I have this feature. So I just push it to you through uh, advertisement. But here is actually more scientific. They monitor your behavior, like what time you surf the internet, what's your need, maybe you need a monitor, uh, maybe you need to do, do something. So, so, so I think even for this year, for example, if I go Lazada and surf certain product, right? Then in the next few minutes, if you go and browse internet, then you'll see the product will appear in your browser. So, so this is how fast the machine learning is actually harnessing the data and, uh, and also trying to show the relevant ads to you. I think this is already a, a trend right now. So uh, I, I will say this is also uh, have some issue with the privacy, but anyway, this is uh, out of the topic, lah, right? So it's just saying that uh, these two areas right now is, uh, is taking place, right? And, and will be increasingly uh, becoming uh, more important. Uh, lastly, uh, Metaverse, so Facebook has uh, committed by uh, investing a lot of money uh, in the Metaverse. So it's actually based on the virtual reality and also blockchain technology, right? Trying, and especially now COVID, a lot of people work from home, they can't go anywhere. So, so maybe this will become, this will, uh, Metaverse will be a trend in the future. People stay at home. Uh, in the virtual reality, in the virtual world, interacting with people and so on. Uh, so, so this is also the, the potential future trend, right? So whether it will happen or not, maybe 20 years we'll see. 
Okay, all right. So I think that's all I have today. Uh, yeah, so if you have further questions, maybe we can uh, uh, talk about in the Q&A session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Kendrick. I hope uh, it was a uh, good learnings from uh, from all of you. Um, there are two questions asked. I noted that uh, we'll take them in the Q&A. Uh, thanks for the question asked by uh, Charlene and also Daryl. We'll take them in the Q&A and don't worry. And uh, let me share my screen again. Next uh, up is Shenping. Uh, Shenping right, uh, has a very interesting profile. Right? Um, he made a career switch uh, before he joined GovTech. So he's uh, sort of uh, coming from a non-tech background into a tech background. And when he first joined GovTech, he was, uh, he was an experienced uh, designer. Uh, so that's a very UX designer. So very quite, quite a different role as well. And then he transit into the current software engineer role at the uh, government digital services and uh, is now working on the, our SG grants portal. So without further ado, uh, over to you, uh, Shenping. Thanks, Dixon. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Is, my, is the screen okay? Yes. Okay, thanks. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shen Ping, I'm a developer in uh, GovTech and I am a mid-career switcher um, to software engineering. So I'm just gonna share some of my reflections and thoughts on this topic today. So a bit of my background is, um, I actually studied economics in uh, university and my past jobs were not related to engineering. Uh, currently I'm in government digital service, services as a developer, um, specifically in Hive, okay. So uh, if you want to find out more, you can check out this link below here. So let me elaborate a bit about this and okay, to let you all know a bit more. So this is just uh, uh, like a stereotype I found. Uh, huh? um, so what is it like being a government engineer, right? <laughs> so some people think actually enterprise engineers, well, everything is very structured, you know, very silo, very specialized, you know. But then the startup engineers are like cowboy, freestyle, you know, do everything. <laughs> then the government engineers too, too busy uh, pulling carts with square wheels. Uh. To even change the round wheels like how so is this true right is it true ah okay so maybe i will help to uh give some uh, shed some light on this huh? <laughs> so things are actually quite different now huh? um so i mean these are generalizations uh, but i think it boils down a lot to your actual team uh, okay so how what the nature of your product you know how is it run not just what company is doing this product you know, so for government, there are also products done in-house. There are some uh, outsourced to uh, other enterprise to do as well. La. So for GDS, um, we do products in-house for government. But you notice that the one common thing, okay, that's true throughout all three of these pictures, right, is that nobody is alone. Uh. Everybody is working with somebody else, no matter how unproductive they are. La. So, um, yeah, so the thing here is that devs, they don't work alone now. Um, you work in some sort of thing, team in an industrial setting. So if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. Okay. So the idea here is that the team matters a lot to the dev. Okay. You either accelerate or you stun each other's learning. Huh? And the team culture is what really makes or breaks the team. Okay. Let me use my current organization as an example. So you've heard me mention GDS a few times, right? Government digital services. So why is it, right? So it is again uh, in-house engineering unit in government. Okay. Some products uh, include uh, Y'all might have used before trace together, go business. So one notable thing about GDS, right? I want to raise is not about its products, but actually its culture. Okay, an engineering culture that's focused on quality. So what do I mean by this? Okay, so for those of you who have worked before, I trust you probably already seen firsthand what company culture can do to a person or teams. Okay, whether it's a toxic or whether it's a nurturing. So, um. Let me raise an example. Okay, imagine you're a company that sells soap and you are a soap maker. Is the company investing more in marketing the soap uh, with ads, uh, for example, or is it investing in making better soap? Okay, so don't get me wrong. Uh, marketing and sales are very important. Uh, but a company that just forgoes making better soap and just relies on sales and marketing is just not a product-oriented company. Uh. It probably has to end up relying on some other third party to ensure the product standard for them, right? It doesn't work on the product itself. So that's what I mean. Okay, similar goes for tech products, right? An organization that has a strong engineering culture, okay, 
places engineering priorities uh, at the same level uh, that it can be prioritized with things uh, that we often think of as non-negotiable, uh, which is probably like deadlines or requirements. Uh. Engineering quality uh, is not a good to have. It's a first class citizen, not a good to have a second class citizen. So to me, that's what I mean by engineering culture. So you might be able to see right already, right? Why culture matters to devs. Uh. So why am I talking about this? Because right, um, as a dev, right, you want to be in a place that has a good engineering culture. Why? Simply put, right, it allows you as a developer to just do engineering as it is without having to sacrifice engineering needs. When you have a chance to go deep into what's best for the engineering and learn from it. So that's what I mean, right? Okay, for, for GDS, right, to be a place like with strong engineering culture. So how does GDS do something like that? Right? Okay, so um, you already have heard uh, in the previous uh, uh, talk just now from Kendrick about Agile. So um, yeah, it's a way of building software through iterative improvements and constant feedback. So GDS also uses that methodology. Okay. Um, and the one thing I want to highlight in this is transparency yeah, as the basis of how we uh, use Scrum. Okay? Transparency and openness comes first. Okay, so this because every everyone needs to understand okay the issues and raise feedback for all the views to be at inspected and for the best ideas to win out to be adopted. Okay, so that's why if you don't have transparency, everything else is, uh, doesn't work out. Okay. So the next thing that helps us achieve this is um, actually engineering practices. Like, by this, I include tools as well. Um, so things like uh, unit testing, integration testing, security testing, okay, all built into a CI CD pipeline or a continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline. So all these are ways in which um, Scrum, okay, what I mentioned before is actually put into action uh, in the technical sense. Okay, structure, okay, the how we organize ourselves is also an important way. Uh. So our teams are actually um, cross-functional, uh, comprising of all the roles that you need uh, to run a project. Uh, I think in certain corporate settings, you call these such teams uh, mission-oriented teams. Uh. So they contain everybody that's required uh, rather than siloing um, different departments and then they work across each other. Yeah. So um, so, so one, some of the characteristics of such teams is that uh, we try to do each other's work as well. Okay, this, it's not considered like bonus. Uh, it's considered actually normal. Um, flat hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, we even have uh, something called quadratic voting where we try to give input to each other's promotion. Uh, the, the developers themselves will interview um, who they want to work with next. Uh, basically, they interview the candidates as well. So, uh, giving the engineers and uh, the developers a key stake in the important actions and decisions are uh, ways which we try to keep the engineering culture strong as well. Okay, so as a developer, you are not ignored. Uh, your views are very important. Okay, so even in business uh, decisions as well, uh, the engineers also have a say that. So, um, in addition to this cultural environment, uh, there's also very strong and explicit support for engineers' technical learning. Okay, this includes outside of work uh, in courses. Okay. Uh, could be uh, courses you take with providers outside or uh, courses that even are offered within uh, the organization itself that's provided by other engineers, okay, as well as your daily work learning from other engineers, okay, there's support for course fees, support for course and attendance time. Yeah, this is one of the things I find that's uh, very helpful. Um, and the other thing is um, uh, active uh, peer support. So basically, um, I would say that uh, your daily interactions, right, pair programming with other engineers is what's really will, will keep you learning every day. Yeah. So on the right here, we also have a, a sort of slogan that we have, which is uh, be happy, be awesome, help others to be happy and awesome. So basically it, it kind of uh, encompasses um, what, um, how GDS as an organization uh, views and treats its engineers. Uh. Okay, so basically, um, it's, it's not about, you know, getting work done at the expense of all else. Uh, okay, it's about also helping the developers to grow so that they get the job done and not just get it done, but actually make good products that help the users. Uh, okay, so it's, 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 it's trying to keep this in a positive cycle. Yeah. Um, so in, in, I, am, I mean, in some places, I would say that uh, this is not always uh, easy to do, but... Um, in organizations that have that may be more successful in forging engineering culture, uh, I believe that this is something that they will try to do. Okay, whether people is 
you know, they are not just means of production. Uh, huh? they, are, they are actually people that grow. Uh. Yeah, and um, yeah, okay. So the thing is this, uh, so why do I spend so much time going I think we lost you. Idea of what to look out for. Okay. Um, not just you know how high they pay you, but but you want to look deeper into um, what does the company do, what does the team do, how they do things. Okay, not to say that you know where I come from is perfect, but um, as a new developer, maybe hopefully this can help you uh, gain some insight and then avoid some of the pitfalls in your job search. Yeah. If you join a good company, you accelerate your learning very quickly. If you join a not so good company, you will still learn, but you will learn things the harder way. Yeah. Okay, and it will test your resolve. Okay, if you uh, join a company that has a different kind of culture. Okay. So maybe let me uh, go uh, into the main topic of career switching now. Okay, without any background. So um, I think the first thing that's important is I want to take a step back, right, and then uh, ask yourself, right, what do you really want, la? So I I mean I hear this a lot, which is you hate your job, right? I hate my job, then. Tech is cool, therefore equals to what? Right. So this kind of conclusion will lead you to okay, so just bring you to a meme. Okay, cannot resist this. Huh? So you all know the Stong's meme, right? So it's tempting to get in on the hype, right? You don't understand the stock market, huh? but then you know you just want to jump in because it's all hype. Then you if you end up with the equivalent of gambling as a decision making <laughs> kind of process. Huh? So poor understanding leads to bad decisions. Huh? So the the parallel of this in tech is you end up somewhere like in tech <laughs> so what is tech right so nobody knows what this is uh. so you know bad decisions uh, sorry so it's like um you know you hate your job plus tech is cool you equals to tech la, uh. but you don't know what tech is la. okay you end up somewhere here you know where you think you've made up your mind but you don't really know what you want to do la. okay similarly for tech right yeah you will need to understand what exactly in tech that is it that you want to do Okay, or you end up all over the place chasing hashtag trending uh, without being getting yourself employable. Yeah, because it's really deep and really broad. Uh. So this is actually okay if this is your level one thinking. Okay, but if you are doing a mid-career switch, right, it's potentially a life-changing decision. And you really need to go deeper than this kind of level one thinking. Okay. Okay, so, so maybe over here I'm just taking a step back from software engineering, then we look at the whole thing. Okay. So so, okay, so we just come to, so previously we talked about, right, what are the pull factors, okay, what's the push factors, okay, broad ones, and then we understand, okay, what are some of the examples right, of areas in tech, uh, okay, so tech is not a homogeneous monolithic block, uh, okay, there are many sub areas in tech, and people spend their entire professional lives uh, just trying to master just one of it, okay, so for someone who's new, I understand it can be very, you don't know where to start, right? So maybe these are just some starting points, uh, okay? Um, of some of the more uh, hip areas, okay? That people are talking about recently. Lah, huh? So some of these can be like data, okay? Or AI, which are different, okay? And cybersecurity or the topic, okay? For today's session, which is software engineering, right? Which actually includes everything from web to mobile to blockchain, uh, okay? It's not good enough to say you want to do tech. Uh. You need to, so I, I can't help you here because uh, other than give you some of these examples or starting points, because uh, you need to really read up and then figure out what is it that you really want to dig in to explore a bit more, okay? And not just because of this. Uh, um, the skill sets in each of these areas are actually very different, okay? Data, AI, cybersecurity, software engineering. And on your journey, right, uh, you will, uh, encounter a lot of difficulties and you will question yourself why you are doing this. So you need, need to be very clear, okay, of the area that you pick and why you pick it, okay, and not like, uh, you know, as you are suffering down, you that did I even come to the right place? Yeah, and what did I suffer all this for, right? So is, career switch is painful uh, and you need to know why, why you are doing this, okay? So that's why I want to ask this question first, okay? So, okay, let's assume, right, okay, you've thought things through, um, you, you know you want it for sure, okay? And then you, okay, I sort of know uh, what's the area I want. So let's assume it's software engineering, right? That's the topic for today. So what's actually, what's in your way, right? What's the blocker you have, right? Actually, it's really, right, 
Okay, you need to pass the interview. Okay, you need to pass the, the technical challenges and the interviews and land the job, right? That's the goal here. So what's in between here and that, right? So, um, so some of the possible gaps, right? Um, broadly, okay, technical fit. Okay, do you fit the job technically? Okay. So here we I distinguish between skills and practices. Okay, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, then next one is culture fit. Okay, culture fit. So what do I mean by this? You remember how important uh, culture is, I, I feel, uh, to a developer. So just as developers look at companies and teams, right, for their engineering culture, the companies are also looking at the developer for their culture fit. Okay, because devs, they want developers that embody a certain quality, right, a certain character. I think uh, um, Hendrik also mentioned some of those uh, qualities that engineers should have, right? Yeah. So some of these characteristics um, they are looking for in, uh, in developers, okay? So um, for example, some of these things can be, you know, insistence on technical quality, test coverage, code quality, um, ability to rationalize your choices, justify your uh, architecture decisions, you know. Basically, it's very unique, solid logical reasoning, uh, things like this, okay? Um, Communication, all these soft skills, I won't go into so much about that. But those definitely are needed. Okay. So third one is a market fit. Huh? You know, basically is the market uh, big, is it like like hot, you know, people are hiring. Yeah. So more or less, I think this is uh, given uh, under current circumstances. Okay. So um starting point, right? I'm just gonna say uh, let's say you have no background, no education, no training, right? So what are you gonna do, right? What you need to really have to do is all the engineers they're hiring all ideally would have technical fit, culture fit, right? So there's no choice around this. You have to replicate what they have done. You have to compress it and you have to leapfrog it. Okay, whatever people have been doing for the past 10 years, uh, people start learning programming from primary school, I think very good. Lah, huh? But if you start learning programming now, I think you really need to, you really need to be like um, accelerated. Lah, okay. So, Minimally, without any background, you are probably two steps away, okay? Technical and culture, right? Not just one, okay? So let me um, elaborate more on what I mean by technical fit, okay? So uh, remember again, right? Tech is not a homogeneous block. Um, but then there are fundamental common areas that are uh, applied to all the various areas of tech. Okay, so I make this distinction between uh, fundamentals and specifics over here. Lah, okay, and in there, I again make the distinction between skills versus practices. Okay, so basically, um, skills are probably what you think they are. It's, it's, it's basically how you go and achieve an outcome. How do you code a program that does something? Practice might be a newer concept to you. It's how you use those skills to achieve an outcome. Okay. So for example, you can build a program, right? That does a calculation with 1,000 lines of code, right? And full of security vulnerabilities and you no know, lags like crazy if more than 10 people use it concurrently and crash on your next update, right? Or you can build something that is, you know, can solve all those problems that I mentioned earlier. Huh? So it's not just about achieving the functionality, okay? It's about how you achieve the functionality also, right? So that is a measure of productivity as well. So things like testing your, your CI CD pipeline, you know, test driven development, all these are the kind of things um, that are part of our practices and that you actually do, you can actually only really practice them in real projects, right? Real products. So you actually, so that's the point I'm trying to make. You actually learn by doing, right? You learn by practicing, right? Therefore you must have projects. Okay, even if it's your own personal projects, right? even if you don't have a job, you must tie in your learning of skills with actual projects. Okay, so that's what I mean by the differentiation between skills and practice. Huh? Okay, so let me just go into the difference between what I mean by fundamentals versus specifics. Okay, so for fundamentals, right, um, I would say this uh, is a bit like cooking. Uh, huh? If you want to be a chef, uh, if there's French cuisine, Chinese cuisine, Indian cuisine, right? right? No, all these are different types of cuisine, but common to all of this, right? There's some basic skills that's common, which is like you know how to set up your kitchen, you know, you know how to use know how to use a knife, how to cut vegetables, how to start a fire, right? These are all basic things, right? Uh, so these are all fundamentals that are common, right? But to really cook French food, Chinese food, Indian food is beyond uh, beyond all these basic skills, right? You need to have like um, you know, what are the typical ingredients for French food, what are the spices for Indian food, you know. 
So those are more like the specific. So can a chef really master all fresh Chinese and Indian cuisine? Same thing, right? Very difficult. So the same for a developer. How you how you master everything is very difficult. Also, right? All areas of tech, very difficult to master everything. But those fundamentals, right? I think those that's actually the that's actually the common part where it should be your first priority to go for lah. Okay, so so things like that, right? Uh, so I list some of them here. Could be things like data structures and algorithms. Uh, these are must take lah. Huh? Then um, some of the projects that maybe you can take after this uh, could be like a basic CRUD app. Lah, if you're talking about software engineering, um, if you're talking about data science, um, basic skills would be Python, lah, using Pandas specifically. Then maybe some basic projects you can pick off Kaggle. Yeah, so these I think I consider fundamentals. Specifics, right? If you want to go into big data, okay? you will probably have to go into Hadoop Spark already, okay? And then uh, for software engineering, maybe if you have to do blockchain, you will go into Solidity. Yeah, all these are skills. Uh, but if you go into the actual practice of it, you'll actually be constructing something like an ML pipeline for big data or a uh, D app, uh, okay, for uh, blockchain. So that's what I mean by difference between skill and practice, okay? Um, and the thing is, if you notice this figure on the right, right, it's actually a... Uh, in a way, I feel like that's how you, you consolidate what you learn, okay, with, from skills to practices in a cycle. Whatever you learn, you try to practice it in a real project. And you come back to new skills and then you go back to a project. So this is how you actually um, not just, uh, just not just attend a class and then, you know, okay, you complete the class, then you know, pat on the back, you know, good job. You know, is you really have to um, apply it so that you consolidate your learning and you know, put it on GitHub, something like that, right? Then you will be prepared. Be why do I say this, right? Because at the end of the day, you recall why I'm talking about this slide, right? You are trying to prepare yourself for the tech challenge and the interview, okay? You are the only one who can assure yourself that you can make the cut. Uh. So to give yourself this confidence, right? You need to code uh, and they will make you code on the spot as well for those places that are worth joining. So you need to prepare yourself for actual projects that they will put you through as well in the interviews. Okay. So, okay, so how to do all this, right? How to do all this? Um, so one thing I found useful is, um, you recall how I said, okay, you are two steps behind, right? Let's say if you have no background. So what are these steps in the middle that people have taken, but you don't have? So typically a good place to start is what are the university syllabus? What are those polytechnic syllabus? Right, you take a look at those syllabus, okay, then you see what are the modules they do. That's typically what companies will expect fresh grads to have, right, when uh, they enter and go for those first interviews. So you should ideally be having the same kind of skill sets as those fresh grads, okay. So that's the step one, uh, okay, syllabus. Second is the job descriptions. I think this part, uh, probably many of you have already know what to do. So go on, uh, link, go on LinkedIn, go on Monster, go on uh, My Careers Future, yeah, use government website, and then uh, you no, know, find out about uh, what are those job descriptions, skill sets they want. Then you try to even take a second step, match them to what are the university syllabus, and then you see what are the overlapping. Those are your number one priority to hit. Okay, for that whatever job you are going for. Okay, it may not be software engineering, maybe data, maybe AI, but make sure you try to figure out what is that top level priority that they want you to have. Okay. <laughs> so um, again, right. One thing that I think Singapore don't lack is online course providers or whatever course providers. There's so many courses out there. Um, everything from online, one from Coursera, Udemy, LeetCode. Nah. So, uh, like these are more uh, DSA, uh, Data Structure Algorithm uh, websites, uh, LeetCode, HackerRank, HackerUp. So all these are very good for practicing, uh, very good for having like uh, uh, on-demand guidance. Uh. Okay, you don't have to rely on anybody. Right? Okay, you can just, at your own pace, you do your own learning. If you prefer to do um, in-person learning, I just scan, you know, our IHLs. I don't want to go into private course providers, you know, the non-IHLs. Even IHLs alone is like so many. <laughs> okay, so many from short courses to full degree programs. Okay, even our, even distance learning degree programs is already so very common now. So um, I think some of you are feeling, okay, um, no paper can or not, right? No paper can. Or not. Actually can, you want to join without paper, Nowadays, uh, companies are more open as long as you can pass the tech challenge and the interview. Um, if you feel that you need this paper, then um, there's plenty of paper. Lah, huh? 
you just need to commit the money and time to get it. Yeah, okay. So the next thing I want to go into is uh, culture fit. Okay, so remember the, the two steps behind, this is the next step, right? Um, no, I won't say next step, uh, this is the second part of it, which is culture. Uh. So I think um, I've mentioned some of these traits previously and the agile methodology, right? Uh, in what a team does. So this is actually not a new thing. Um, you can read up this thing called the Agile Manifesto online. Um, it's, it's basically a way of uh, doing software development. And the actionable thing behind this uh, is actually a certified Scrum Master course. Uh. So, um, I mean, doing this course doesn't make you a Scrum Master. Uh. It just gives you a... I would say that this course gives you a very good idea of uh, how Agile is practiced, uh, specifically the Scrum methodology uh, okay, of Agile is practiced. Um, and I won't say you are going to this course to, to memorize all the principles, uh, okay? It's more like a philosophy, a uh, way of doing things, and it's almost like a religious conversion. So for people who, who some who go in and come out, they come out preaching, you know, they preach uh, agile to everybody, scrum already, yeah. Uh, but then, to me, you come out being a believer is good enough. Uh, don't have to really convert to become the pastor, okay? So this thing is regardless of whether you do tech or not, right? I believe this really helps you because it's really a way of thinking and doing things, uh, okay? But um, where it's really being practiced is in Agile, okay, in software development, yeah, okay. So this something is actually, no matter whether you, you know, maybe after today, I don't want to do, I don't want to convert anymore. Uh, this is also no harm to do one, okay. This is, will be helpful for everyone, yeah. So, okay, my suggestion is this. Uh, so now that, okay, I, I, so I give you an idea of this. Uh, so, okay, you know that the goal is the interview. You know that you're two steps behind. I have given you some idea of how to make those two steps. Okay, so now what you're trying to do is you try preparing and you try going head on uh, for those challenges and interviews first. Okay, you see whether you can make it. Maybe that's a test, right? But if you're really having trouble, right? Like this is really not working out. You cannot learn yourself, you know? Then maybe you might want to try a more indirect approach here. Okay, so the indirect approach, what do I mean? Is if you can't get into a tech role, you try getting into a tech organization first. Okay, and then again, why I mentioned culture is so important. Um, good culture, try to join, try to look for a place with a good culture, okay? Um, it's, the reason is because if you get into a place with good culture, then you will get more support, uh, okay, in, in your conversion journey. Okay, most likely places like this are open, okay? They support your autonomy and they are in your own self-motivation in learning. Right, so if, if you are dedicated to picking up your technical skills or whether it's uh, whatever skills, they are likely to support you, okay? And in such, to get into such a position, right, uh, most likely, right, you are applying to a role where you already have a strong value proposition based on your current job, okay? Not in an engineering skill set, okay? So, uh, so maybe you are very uh, good in some kind of uh, product management, some kind of manager, uh, uh, maybe accounts handling or something like that. Um, so maybe you, you join like as a, some kind of a product management role or something like this. And then you actually get to work with the engineering team, right? And then you actually get to achieve a cultural fit first, right? Uh, you actually try to understand what they're actually doing, right? While you gauge your own technical interests uh, and prove your ability, okay? So that at least brings you one step closer, right? Two steps behind, at least brings you one more step closer, okay? And then at this point, I would want to encourage everybody if you do take this way right you try to review your decision to switch again okay what is it that you really want okay by doing this uh, i think what government like to call now the tech light role uh, tech light role have you already achieved what you want you know previously maybe your decision oh, i hate my job and tech is cool so in this tech light role have i already oh i don't hate my job anymore and i'm in the place where i think you know i'm doing tech and it's cool so you know is it okay you know, perfectly okay to you know to stop here and then you're happy in this job or do you really want to struggle you know, and continue to achieve your technical fit? Okay, and you die die also want to be an engineer. So this is the place where you ask yourself because um, you know, remember how uh, Kendrick talked about whether you really have passion for coding, right? If you really can write the code, you give 10 years, 10 hours a day, you'll be very happy. But if you don't, this is the point where you ask yourself, are you better off being in a tech like role or do you really want to continue struggling, okay? So again, uh, um, 
I want to raise a caveat in this indirect approach that sounds like great, right? Um, no matter in what company, right? Okay, there are always going to be awesome teams and there are going to be awful teams. Uh. Okay, so what mainly matters again, uh, come back to culture again. So you must be very mindful uh, in what kind of team you are joining if you are going for the indirect approach. Again, right? Okay, good places only take good people. Bad places, uh, they will take anybody. <laughs> so in those good places, right? Okay, they will really uh, let you grow. Bad places, they treat you like a table and chair. Huh? You, don't, you don't invest in table and chairs. Like you invest in people. So the caveat here is, if you're going to take an indirect approach, um, if you pick the wrong company, it's going to backfire on you. <laughs> so be careful if you try to take an indirect approach. Not all places have resources to grow people, okay? Or the kind of mission to grow people as well. Yeah. So again, I was on the show here again. You know, no matter in what company you are in, they can all be, you know, too busy, too, too engrossed in whatever to even do anything innovative or productive. Okay. The, the, the company, whether it's enterprise, startup or government, doesn't matter. What matters is, are you able to sift through and see why is the team culture there? Yeah. I know it's not easy, um, but if you, so that's why, you know, uh, personal connections, you know, graph roles help to, you know, find out more about the teams, you know, see if, these are the kinds of places that help you take an indirect approach. Okay, but again, the indirect approach is only if you can, you cannot, you find there's trouble going through the direct approach, which is through your sheer um, or talent, ability, or grit. Uh, you make it through. Uh, okay. Um, at the end of the day, uh, okay, sorry, this, I have one more thing I wanted to add is, okay, one more thing you probably can look for support from is all these interest groups. Okay, so uh, there are plenty of tech interest groups out there. Um, no, I just Googled some. Um, many of these uh, big companies also uh, have their own engineering blogs, you know, hold their own sessions, uh, have their own pages. Now. Okay, so um, some of these are also places where you can go and find and ask more people. Mm, because, uh, I mean, of course, I'm just one data point here. Uh, by no means am I the only person to have done a big career switching. There are plenty of others like me who I will feel are more successful than me as well. So do talk to more people, okay, and find out more. So um, I'm actually nearing the end of this presentation and I'm trying to, and I hope that maybe you realize that uh, this is just one possible uh, interpretation of how to assess, you know, uh, career switching, how to uh, see what are the potential gaps in a career switch, okay, and um, what are the possible approaches to try to fill those gaps. Um, but there is no perfect formula or perfect solution. Uh, okay. I'm also not here to, you know, like um, cheer you, cheerleader you on to jump into a career switch. Uh, everything is rosy and happy. Uh, I'm also not trying to scare you off with like, ah, this is terrible, you know, don't do it. Um, what I hope I've done is I, I try to make your decision more informed. Okay. I try to give you more information, hopefully some insight. Okay. Maybe avoid making some mistakes, you know. Um, yeah. So, um, at the end of the day, right, um, I would think that uh, you need to be able to convince yourself uh, because things will get very tough. Uh, the struggle is real uh, and you won't have any easy choices or easy way out once you start on this path. Uh. Um, so you need, to, you need to decide for yourself and to find out more, really. You know, don't get stuck in the kind of level one thinking. Try to go deeper. Um, so education is what people do for you. Uh. Learning is what you do for yourself. Okay? And you need to embrace this struggle. You need to learn for yourself and embrace it. Okay? Yeah. So I think uh, that's what I wanted to uh, communicate uh, in terms of message. Yeah? Okay, so that's all. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mb. Right. Uh, very interesting sharing. I do have some questions I noted. Maybe I'll take that in Q&A uh, for the benefit of uh, everyone. All right, um, we have the last speaker for the day uh, before we do our uh, Q&A. And uh, let me welcome, and uh, let me share my slide so that you can put a face to the speaker. And let's welcome Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan is a customer engineer in uh, Google. And um, he is the, uh, he's, he's in the public sector under Google Cloud JPEG, right? And he started his career in Cisco as a software development intern. And uh, in, in the US, right? And uh, back in Singapore, he worked remotely as a software engineer and uh, contributed to various projects in Cisco's days. Uh, and then he moved to the cloud. And finally, now he's at Google Cloud as a customer engineer. 
So uh, without further ado, let me uh, let me let Jonathan share his perspective of uh, opportunities in, in big tech and uh, what we call digital natives. Uh, over to you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yeah. So, uh, so first of all, thank you, SCS, uh, for having me here today. Uh, so I just want to uh, apologize uh, in advance because I'm in the second day of my COVID, so I have a bit of uh, sore throat going on. So I hope my uh, voice stay with me for the entire session. Uh, so if everyone can see my slide, uh, okay. So we're just probably going to start uh, by sharing some fun facts about myself. I mean, this is just sharing, right? So this is a bit about myself, my personal journey of uh, how I got started in tech and you know where I uh, currently working on in my role uh, at Google Cloud. Uh, so in the 2000s, I graduated uh, from NTU uh, in a computer engineering degree. Uh, so I finished my third year with a pretty okay result and I was given a chance to uh, proceed to my uh, honors year. By the time uh, I saw a, a newspaper uh, job advert uh, from EDB and they were looking for a fresh grad right, to actually uh, sign up for this uh, intern traineeship program. So at the time, uh, I was uh, in my in my third year. I, I did very well in computer networking, so I you know fell in love with the topic, and I really wanted to find out uh, you know exactly like how computer networking is really like. Need like, to go a bit deeper. So when I saw that job advert, uh, advertising Cisco system, you know at the time in the early two thousand, uh, Cisco is in the center of the internet boom. So I immediately uh, you know gave up uh, you know my study and I uh, took up this opportunity. So uh, thankfully. After a few rounds of interview, I managed to land an intern role uh, with Cisco System, uh, the headquarters in, 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 you know, down in San Jose, uh, Silicon Valley. So I think to a fresh grad like me at the time, uh, you know, it was like a dream come true. Lah. So you know, not many people ever had this chance to experience uh, you know, life in Silicon Valley. So I uh, you know, gave up everything. You know, my girlfriend was uh, in Singapore, so I uh, took the chance to uh, you know, travel there and I lived there for close to two years uh, as a software development intern. Uh, so it's, uh, it was over as a good experience, uh, but you know, it's not like those grammar that you can, you, you guys usually see on like the, the, the Silicon Valley uh, Netflix, you know, uh, TV serial. So at the time, um, it was a pretty like steep learning curve for me at the start. So, uh, you know, most of the stuff I learned uh, back in schools, uh, you know, they, they really helped me a lot, but I think uh, to discover Things, things in real life, I discovered that I had to put in a lot of effort. So I had this passion uh, you know, into learning uh, about networking and I spent a lot of time uh, with my mentor, right, between my department and, you know, try to learn everything uh, that I could from him. So uh, at the time I was working as a, an intern helping out to fix, you know, some uh, iOS bugs. Uh, so iOS is the Cisco operating system for the networking devices. So I uh, picked up C programming language, you know, during a time. You know, so I think this really helped me in a way because uh, I, I did see back in NCU days, but I think to be able to get down to the level where uh, to understand uh, how to build a working product, you know, a world-class product that Cisco builds, you know, using C. So that, that really like helped me to really uh, master, you know, one language and also like able to understand the concepts, you know, of programming pretty well. I also learned other uh, scripting languages like TCL. Probably you guys might not have heard about that. You know? So TCL is a scripting languages uh, that uh, Cisco used to build uh, their you know, testing you know, kind of a tool sets. So, uh, so I spent 18 months uh, learning you know, the various networking protocol. Uh, then I, I finished my CCNA, CCNP while in the US. Uh, so uh, my, my, my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, she visited me in US and I also chance to thought of like, should I continue to stay in US? Uh, because a lot of my uh, colleague, my senior in my department, uh, many of them uh, you know, graduated with master and then they decided to stay in uh, California. Uh, by the time uh, I couldn't because of the visa, right? So I also expected my wife uh, wishes that she didn't really like life, you know, staying in the US. So I came back to Singapore and I started looking for jobs, right? So I tried to look for, uh, you know, jobs that are similar to what I did in, you know, in, in, in uh, Cisco in the San Jose. Uh, but I, to, to my a bit of surprise, uh, at the time, I couldn't really find a job that really uh, matches, you know, the experience that I gained uh, during my internship. So at, at the time, uh, it happened to have, I mean, that during that 2003 and four, uh, there was this dot-com bubble burst. So that made life looking for a job even harder. 
So most of the job opportunity I see back there in the market, uh, they are mostly like you know, pre-sales consulting, you know, mostly sales related, supporting the sales, you know, as a system engineer. You know, so to get to those role, uh, it wasn't easy, right? So I had to make sure I have you know some of the some of the uh, prerequisite, right? So I started to study for the Cisco CCIE. Yeah, so it took me a couple of attempts to finally uh, pass the exam, right? So, so that uh, certification uh, at the time really helped me a lot because it opened doors for me, you know, into a future opportunity. Then, uh, so that's actually the story how I uh, started in software development. Hi. Hi. Sorry, uh, is, is there a question from uh, anybody in the audience? Oh. No, I think uh, you, you go ahead, uh, Jonathan. Okay, sure. Yep. Uh, so, so that basically explain, uh, you know, the journey that, you know, why I shifted, you know, from a software development uh, back to, you know, doing like sales. So I found a role, right, uh, back in Cisco as a system engineer. And I also wanted to, uh, like, learn more, right, to find out, like, how is it like being a sales engineer? So even though my passion uh, had to, like, take a, you know, take a different direction at the point of time. So I, I took it very positively. I basically, uh, you know, tried to, I, I tried to, to, to actually uh, adapt to the new role. And it was a very uh, difficult shift because, uh, you know, in development, we usually work in, you know, in the back end with a team. But now, suddenly, I had to, uh, I had to engage customer or face to face. I had to build relationship with this customer. So, so I took me like about a few months to close to a year to adapt you know, the new role and its requirement. Then shortly later, I, you know, I, I, I actually started to fall in love, right, doing sales because I, I enjoyed that building relationship part with the customer. So this customer, uh, you know, it started as a customer relationship, customer vendor relationship, but I think over time, it became like friendship. And then uh, it's also good to see like, you know, the, 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 the kind of solution that I put together, uh, seeing this being deployed into a real life network. So, so that, you know, I, I spent about five years uh, supporting the Calco uh, customer uh, in Cisco. Then later on, I uh, started to, uh, you know, wanted to explore other stuff. So a bit about myself is that I, I'm a person more like a general all trades, right? So I, I wanted to explore uh, different technology, right? So I discovered that I know I have this passion to not to stay in one uh, area. I want to like learn uh, the most I can from, from, from you know, while being this role. And then later I want to move on to discover, you know, to actually discover new things. So I started to uh, find other roles between the company. So, uh, so thankful to Cisco, they offered me a lot of opportunities, you know, for internal movement within the company. So I moved from like uh, doing a pre-sales support in the service provider to the enterprise team. So uh, from working with telco customer to like, enterprise customer, and I started to dabble in like different technology and I discovered that, you know, my greatest passion now is to actually to discover new things, to learn new things that like never try to like uh, stay status quo. So I started to pick up stuff like blockchain. Uh, so I just also, uh, also dabble in like, IoT, uh, supporting the enterprise uh, customer like manufacturing, you know, to deploy some IoT solution that Cisco built back then. Then, uh, then when this cloud computing uh, journey started to happen, also with this software defined networking, uh, where you know everything is now software, so I, I started to like uh, realize that I have still have the biggest passion in software, right? As a coder, you know, so I, I started to like you know I now I can see that I have the ability to do the best of both worlds, you know, being to do the uh, to be able to do the technology that I love, but also you know to also uh, to relieve my passion, you know, doing some kind of coding. So this gave me the best of both worlds, and I uh, started to work with a uh, customer. Uh, helping them to build like telco clocks, uh, orchestration, you know, to help them to use software to automate their infrastructure. Then when this cloud computing uh, became big time, I wanted to learn more about cloud. So I started to pick up uh, AWS, uh, Azure, and then Google, and also uh, pick up, uh, you know, most of the fast food things I see out there, you know, from the cloud native uh, computing foundation. Uh, so especially things like uh, Docker's, uh, Git, CICD and uh, Golang plus uh, Kubernetes. So I think today uh, I really like feel that my biggest passion today is in this area. I mean, there might be a time where I think I need to move on to do other things, but I think at present uh, I, I felt that my biggest passion is in you know in this uh, cloud uh, space. So uh, I decided to make a difficult move, you know, from 
a company that I stay for more than 10 years, uh, you know, to uh, find a job between uh, one of the cloud service provider. And I uh, definitely I managed to find a role in Google that allowed me to continue my passion in this area. Yep, so, uh, so that is a bit about myself uh, and how I got here. So I will share a bit about uh, my perspective about IP, the IT uh, opportunities for software developers in Singapore uh, back then and now. So this is basically uh, based on my personal opinion. So I think when, when I graduated uh, back then, uh, I actually leave out one, uh, my, 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 my first job is actually not an intern. So my first job back then was actually, uh, I, I worked for three months in a small startup company uh, as a Java developer. So uh, because, there was this was my first job, and I think that at the time the pay was pretty okay. So I just like grab whatever I could find after I you know finished my studies. Then I, you know, while waiting, uh, if, you know, for the news from NTU whether I can proceed to my honor year, you know, I found this job. So I I started to like work in this small team uh, of Java developers, like uh, building this air uh, this airline ticket booking uh system. So I didn't have uh, you know, a lot of passion in Java back then. And I wasn't really uh, very keen, you know, in uh, you know in the product itself. So I think uh, that is where I discovered that you know as uh, IT, uh, you know, uh, as you embark into this tech uh, industry, I think the, the 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 biggest important thing is about passion, right? So you have to really fall in love in what you do. Uh, otherwise, you know, no matter how well paying this job is, uh, you know, you probably will not last. Uh, your time, you know, in this role. So I, you know, when I saw the advertisement uh, from EDB about this Cisco system opportunity, you know, I quickly jumped on this, uh, you know, without thinking much. So, and also back then uh, in 2000, there were very limited opportunities for Java developers and it's very focused. So uh, like C++ and C++ Java, th this were the, you know, the more prominent languages uh, at the point of time. Uh, but, you know, most of the job opportunity I saw back then is mostly like helping, you know, the, you know this comp you know those company to build their, their their company product right so very specific to uh to this company so I I, felt, I actually felt that I could not really take the experience uh you know elsewhere so this was what I felt uh so but today what I see this uh in the current market is actually very different so today I think with the startups and all the digital native uh, born your clock companies in Singapore uh there are plenty of opportunities uh you know for software developers in Singapore but I think uh, you know, alluding to uh, Kendrick and uh, Jumping, I think the biggest, uh, the, the most important point is whether, you know, you have the passion, right, to love what you do, right? So beside, before you decide on the role, taking up the role as a software developer, you know, you, you should look beyond the money. So look at whether you really love uh, the technology. Do you love the job, you know, the thing they built? So I think if you love what you do, right? The financial part will actually come naturally together with it. And today I also see that there's a lot of uh, technology that you can actually like move yourself laterally, right? So uh, it's not that like very specific to one uh, kind of product, you know, when I first started. So today, if you learn uh, one languages, like for example, uh, Java or you know, C Sharp, you, know, you can actually like uh, move laterally into many different industry. I mean, between the IT industry, you know, into different companies. And today there's also a uh, newer tech uh, combined to back then it's like big data, uh, AI, ML, and also things like crowd infrastructure automation, uh, blockchain, SRE, and full stack. So these are the role uh, that, you know, really uh, I do see there's a lot of opportunities, uh, you know, uh, at the moment, right? For companies to actually like hire these uh, talents, you know, who have passion in this area. So this is my opinion of uh, what was then and what is now. Okay, so uh, I will probably share my also views on like what does it take, right? To uh, let's say if you are really interested in taking in considering a career in site reliability engineering or SRE or full stack or DevOps, uh, so what is this role all about, right? So for SRE, uh, full stack and DevOps, uh, you know these are the guys that you know works very closely with the development team, right? So they are the guys who basically uh, take care of the infrastructure, right? So this infrastructure it could be, uh, you know the companies uh, on premises, or it could be something on the public cloud. So these roles, I, I will find that it's very, uh, you know, very uh, rewarding because you get to learn about like hardware, right? You get to learn about infrastructure, right? How things run. You get to learn about networking uh, systems, the you know, operating system and the tools for you to basically like make things automate. And you also get the chance to, uh, you know, expose yourself to uh, learning about public cloud uh, providers, 
right? And also the on-prem infrastructures and all kinds of technologies like virtual machine, uh, whether it's VMware, you know, or KVM serverless like Kubernetes, or also physical uh, server. So you get a chance to expose yourself to a lot of different uh, technology. And also uh, this role, you know, you have to really love like building automation, right? You need to you need to love like how how to help the help the development team uh, to be more agile, you know, help them to reduce their time to software releases, you know, by helping them to basically stand up all these uh, like CICD pipelines, you know, to, to help them to, to, to become more uh, efficient in what they do, right, coding. So, so this is also a good area for you to uh, help them, but, uh, you know, the skill sets for that is uh, things like Terraform and Sable, and so these are the typical skill, skill sets I see nowadays that is uh, like, a, uh, it's part of the job requirement, right, for SRE. So you also get a chance to work with the developer team. So you may, if you do have the, the you know, the, the passion to become a software developer right away, I think SRE could be a good role to start, right? So this gives you a chance to uh, see how developers work, right? And then you get to see like the, you know, how to build this tool uh, chain around them to help them to, uh, you know, you can also learn about the software development cycle, the releases, and how to deploy this software on the production system. So these are actually, uh, it's a very good role for you to, you know, get the best of both worlds. So there are also other skill sets uh, that you should probably think about including yourself like uh, storage or right? security practices. Uh, some big organization, uh, they have a strong emphasis of what we call the shift left security. So uh, using, uh, you know, e this is by incorporating security practices into the software development cycle. So this is also a chance for you to explore whether you have an interest into cybersecurity later on. So I would say that uh, the programming languages uh, that really help you in SI car is Python. So because Python, uh, to me, uh, is the language that basically, uh, you know, like glue a lot of things together. So it's a very universal, uh, universal type of languages that allow you to, you know, once you get a good foundation in Python, then you can actually move on to discover other things like GoLang, uh, you know, other, other kinds of languages. Uh, then you also learn about like networking skill sets, right? So you don't have to be a dedicated, like, uh, you know, a networking engineer, but you can, you know, through this role, you can learn about uh, stuff like how cloud providers uh, operate their cloud networking, like how do they operate load balancers, CDN, DNS, etc. Then, of course, last but not least, uh, you also get to know about like deploying applications uh, onto your production system. Of course, SRE, uh, at times, you also need to prepare yourself to be on call, right? So you also need to, uh, like, you know, when things break, you need to have that troubleshooting skills. So being able to analyze problem quickly and also like, you know, identify the problem, working with different stakeholders, troubleshoot and getting things resolved. This is also like a important skill sets uh, into becoming a good SRE engineer. So, so lastly, uh, my view on software development uh, and that includes like UX UI uh, developers as well. Uh, so I think, uh, my two other speakers have covered this topic somewhat. So I would just like, you know, highlight some of the important ones, I think. So the roles uh, vary across, right? And so, you know, it can, it can range from front-end, back-end database, UX designer, uh, whether it's mobile application developers. Uh, so I think this really depends on where is your interest. Uh, so when you look for a job for software developers, uh, I, I guess, you know, in order for you to um, like able to grow yourself in this role, I think it's very important that you look for something that you're passionate in, right? So do you like to, I mean, do you like to develop mobile applications, for example? So if you like, you know, to develop using like Flutter's code, uh, uh, you know, Swift or the Android code, uh, you can actually, you know, look for jobs that require you to build those products. Yeah, because as I said, uh, you know, passion is very important, right? So without passion, uh, I don't find myself able to like, you know, get through all these different roles that I had. Then uh, there are some roles that require you to build like front end, right? So I know like developers uh, that, does front end, right? Some like to do back end, right? So do you have an interest in building very beautiful user interfaces, right? So using like Node.js, React.js, for example. So this, this could be a role uh, that you can, you know, identify whether you like this part of the development, then look for those role, but uh, that, you know, require you to build those uh, user interfaces. Uh, then for back end, I think uh, understanding API is important, right? So API, uh, because it's not just confined to software development, because even in SRE and also uh, like in other areas, IT, like even in the network engineers. So APIs are very important uh, these days, right? So understanding, uh, you know, the basic like REST API, RPC, for example, like how, how do, do you use API to be able to make consistent call to the backend? How do you expose API to the front end? So this understanding of this API uh, will allow you to actually like move laterally across, you know, many different platforms or many different uh, areas. 
And then, yeah, so the three technologies I mentioned for mobile app developers. Yep, so something about Golang, right? So I think in my journey, uh, like pick up programming languages, right? So as I mentioned, I, I started with C uh, back in my intern days in Cisco. Uh, so, so to me, uh, understanding or learning all the different languages are, are not really important because uh, I don't really see myself like, you know, understanding 10 languages, I, I would be able to retain my knowledge for all these 10, uh, you know, without doing any uh, practical work. So uh, reading a book, you know, is never, never my philosophy of learning. So I always believe uh, in, you know, learning by doing. So my experience with like pick up new languages like Golang, for example. Uh, so I think a few years back uh, when I had to, uh, solve a problem, you know, for a particular product, uh, you know, back in my days, uh, you know, in my last role in Cisco, uh, I, I had to uh, basically look at like, uh, you know, how the upstream open source community, uh, you know, the code that they, they, they actually built. Right? So I, I had uh, this experience looking at the project where I had to modify, where I had to clone that, that you know, the upstream git and then modify some of the code uh, that's written in Golang for uh, Kubernetes. So, so this was how I actually like uh, my personal journey on picking a new language. So I think my experience and my uh, you know learning C at a time really helped me a lot, right? So understanding one language well and master it. So this allow you to then uh, you know apply the concept and then allow you to pick up other languages very easily. So of course uh, I, I didn't learn Golang for sake of learning Golang at a time. So I wanted to solve this very specific uh, product issue right with 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 you know with this certain product. So I had to learn Golang uh, to actually like you know build this solution uh, in a very short time. So you know this allow you because like if I'm fixated or fixing a problem, right? So I will naturally spend myself, and I, I will you know, spend a lot of time uh, you know, looking at the code, right? So I will learn things very fast, you know, that way. So this is like how I actually like pick up new stuff. So now knowing the problem that you're passionate in, solve it, you know, in, in, the, in the process of solving it, then you can then pick up new languages uh, much more easy. So, uh, so for software, software developers, I think these days there's also emphasis on the modern software development life cycles and methodologies like, like trial factors app, you know, all the different ways of modernizing applications. So this is also uh, uh, important, you know, knowledge that you, you should have. Uh, not necessarily that you apply it, you know, in all the roles that you, you know, you're going to, uh, uh, you know, if you apply a role as a software developer, it's not necessarily that you apply the trial factors, but I think knowing these concepts are important. So I, I always read a lot of uh, blogs, uh, you know, on a website like medium.com, for example, like even like uh, Stack uh, Overflow. So to understand like, uh, you know, like blog posts that's uh, shared by other developers uh, around all these practices. So I can get a lot of in very insightful and interesting, uh, you know, knowledge from them. Then for software developers these days, uh, especially for startup, right? So this startup, uh, most of them are born in the cloud, right? So uh, knowing technology like serverless containers and microservices are important, right? So as a software developers, uh, you, you may not uh, be able to rely entirely on your SRE engineer, right? To actually deploy, because you need to know like how to build your software, how do you apply the microservices concept, you know, to allow you build this very agile uh, software development component. So these are also important in the modern software developers. Then databases is also uh, important sometimes, right? So knowing the different uh, SQL, no SQL databases, uh, sometimes important, you know, in the software development role. Yep, uh, so, so this is my last slide. Uh, that's my sharing about my own personal journey, uh, you know, my views on the current opportunities in IT in a particular SRE and software developers. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. All right, we've uh, come to the end of the three uh, presentation, right? Um, now it's actually the Q&A session, uh, Q&A panel. Uh, I won't be showing the, the, the slide. And uh, let's take some questions from the floor, uh, if any. I think there are some that were asked and also answered in the chat. I hope uh, those answers were satisfactory. So I'd like to open the floor now to the, to the rest who are attending and uh, ask your questions uh, either in person, um, unmute yourself, or you can type it in the chat, right? Mm. Okay, maybe while the guys are thinking about the questions and uh, and what to ask? Huh? Hi. Let, let's. Yeah, go question. Okay, Hello. go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Hi. 
Sorry, my name is Terence. Uh, I just have a simple simple question for any of the panelists to answer. Yeah. Uh, but it is this: if um, I guess if the person, if I'm a person who has uh, no technical back, maybe two questions. One is if I'm a person who has no technical background and I want to be a software developer, what is the first course or thing I should sign up for? So that's if I don't have a technical background. On the other hand, if I do have some technical background, say I'm an engineer, same question again, what is the first thing that I should go and look at? Because I think that the different panelists have shared uh, different types of approaches, uh, you know, whether it's about technical skills or cultural skills, agile, different languages and things like that. So if we had to make our choice and prioritize uh, for the two different types, non-technical and technical background, uh, what is the first thing that we should go and do if we want to become a software engineer? Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll let the, the, the panelists or speakers uh, take a step at this. Anyone want to go first? Or even Andy uh, who's here, um, may want to chip in with the answers. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll just start. Okay, so um, I think for mid-career switches, right, there are many channels that you can uh, switch your career. So I think E2I, uh, I think just now PC mentioned, right, well, was one of the channel whereby you talk to the career coach, then they will guide you uh, how to uh, enroll into different programs and it's typically a government subsidized program, right? Like SkillsFuture, SGUS, uh, Mid-Career Switcher, there, there are lots of programs that can help you based on your uh, current situation to switch into a uh, software developer role. Uh. <clears throat> so, so for example, like NCS, we are also working with uh, some vendors. Actually, they go through this uh, SGUS program, and uh, eventually they will go through uh, subsidized uh, training, like uh, maybe two months or so, right? Uh, after going through certain structure courses, uh, we also give them assignment and also opportunity. Then eventually they will be uh, hired eventually by NCS, for example. Mm. Yeah. Uh, maybe I just add to what Kendry was sharing. Yes, E2Y has this program called SU United. It's usually for mid-career switch uh, also. And uh, if you have certain technical background, that would be great. For example, we have also um, staff in Data Spark who was project managers. And they got training through SU United. And then uh, they got in with us and we trained. And now he's a data engineer. So, uh, so those are really uh, good programs to go through. So SU United under E2Y is one group one group channel, uh, the skillsfuture.gov, uh, which is the, another program that you can look at. And also under IDMA, the, the Tesla Accelerator programs. Uh, I'll post a link in the chat later. Those are good things you can look at. And there are various boot camps also, uh, organized by various commercial parties. Uh, some are free, some are a little more expensive uh, that you can look at to uh, learn from zero to something that is useful and real world. Yeah, hmm. hope that answers the question. Anybody want to add more to that? Yep. Uh, take one, uh, I will add more. Uh, spec speaking from the experience of SU United, uh, because we also participated in the SU United, there are two, uh, there are a lot of successful cases, but two cases I can probe, uh, uh, I can check, share is uh, one, uh, one lady actually made career switch also, joined us already. Uh, she's part of our data analyst team. Uh, there's a second uh, gentleman who actually joined from audit to network engineer at 49 years old. I must give it to him, seriously. Uh, the reason why I share these two cases is because there will be challenges when you do mid-career swap. Uh, we don't want to hide from that. But the thing is that you must think carefully. And then uh, the, the path, the journey ahead will be supported at, by us in the industry, by the government as well. There's a lot of training provided, but the thing is that you have to find your way because the training will be there. Whether halfway through you think that hey, this is still not the right path, um, you, you got to manage that. Uh, you know? So that's that's the guidance that we have uh, from the sharing of uh, SG United. Yeah, all, but all good. There's a lot of support from the industry in terms of training, uh, in terms of funding grants and programs from the government. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe allow me to add on. So for mid-career switchers, right, when we interview uh, these kind of candidates, <clears throat> we are actually not looking at their 
uh, programming experience. They are looking, assessing based on their uh, logical thinking, whether they have uh, analytical skills and also able to articulate what their thoughts. <clears throat> so for example, like uh, given a problem, how are they going to solve it uh, and apply all these uh, algorithm uh, in the correct fashion, for example. So these are how we assess uh, whether these are the right people to join this program. Now. So we are actually not looking at their academic results or or even like programming uh, experience and so on. Yeah. And also with a good uh, good attitude to learn. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Thank you for that. I hope that answered the question, uh, Terence. But happy to chat more offline. Okay, Thank actually, you. That, yeah, okay. No problem. You're welcome. Uh, we have one question on Daryl. I think it's an interesting one uh, for Xin Ping, actually. It actually, also one of the questions I want to ask, and for the benefit of the audience is the how I think Shenping emphasizes a lot about culture, right? Yeah, and joining a good culture, uh, good engineering culture company, right? And then uh, in your experience, what are the telltale signs of a good company culture, right? From the outside in, right? looking in, right? is uh, what are the sort of things that you look out for? Shenping, you, you, you have anything to share on that? I think it's, it's really not easy to tell actually what's the engineering culture of the company. You really need to find out from someone who is in the company. La. That's one of the um, difficult parts about this. Uh. Um, but I mean, you know, a lot of, for a lot of uh, companies, their reputation precedes them already. La. You roughly already know which are the companies that are, well, all the devs are chowing there, you know, even if the place is like, <laughs> you know, may not be the best paying, may not be the, you know, most uh, slack life, but, you know, people are just, just, you know, banging against the wall just to get in, uh, you know. Uh, some of these are uh, you know, outward telltale signs without even trying to you know, find out deeper. Lah. But um, I think some of these basic signs I mentioned before can be like uh, openness, transparency, autonomy, uh, respect for personal views, focus on quality. I think quality is actually one of the main signs that you can tell as uh, from the outside as someone with no inside knowledge. Um, you, you can probably tell from a product, right, um, what is the kind of quality they actually what kind, of, what kind of level of quality they are striving for? You know, ten years the product are never changed, but still the same one. You know, is 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 like you know, it's just that same. You don't see any sign of improvement. Uh, you know, it's they are just there to you know BAU day in day out. You know, no improvements, no changes. You know, versus an app which is like you know every two months they are like doing something new. You can tell that they are improving. You know, these are actually signs that as a user you can already tell what is the kind of team behind this kind of product, how this product is being run really. Yeah. Thanks for that, Shimbi. Yeah. Um, let me see. Any other question? Ah, okay. Uh, also from Daryl. I think this is a this sort of a more generic question. I think it is good to answer. Uh, like someone who's considering going to software development, right? What are the good habits to develop from the start? Uh, yeah. Anyone care to share? Uh, maybe uh, Jonathan. Yeah, uh, thank you, sorry. Could you repeat the question again? Yeah, the answer is, uh, the question is, uh, if for someone who's considering going to software development, yeah, what are some of the good habits to develop uh, from the start? Okay, so good habits. Uh, so in terms of like uh, hygiene uh, for coding. Uh, so, so I guess uh, some of the habits I uh, have observed, right, uh, from some of my uh, full-time software developer colleagues uh, so, so I think documentation is actually very important, right? So, because uh, today I think a lot of uh, companies I work with, right? So they they are they want to modernize the application, but a lot of this application, uh, you know, the 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 source code, you know, is no is no longer maintained because most of the employee had left and there was no documentation. So, uh, a lot of time, you know, we, we can't do any kind of refactors of these apps, uh, to like microservices. So, you know, these companies will have to force uh. But they are forced to do a complete rewrite, right? So that is very costly, and a lot of time, this company they will not uh, do it uh, because the risk is too, uh, like you know, it could be a career ending move for some of the management if if things go wrong. So I think as a software developer, documentation is very important. Uh, so you know, able to work with the team, uh, you know, adopting some of the source uh, source code control, source code management system, right? So things like Git, you know, this is very important. Uh, how do you work collaboratively uh, in these processes? Uh, elevation on those two. So you must have that discipline uh, to be able to, uh, you know, like work together with your teammate, uh, you know, in, in, in this kind of uh, DevOps uh, cycles. 
uh, so of course, uh, being able to like build uh, the, you know, having a passion, of course, definitely, you know, I, I mentioned this many times. So having a passion in building the, the stuff that you love and, uh, you know, helping, uh, you know, your users uh, solve the problem. So this is very important. So, uh, I mean, just for sharing at Google, I think one of the philosophies is to respect the user because we respect the user, everything will follow. So, you know, helping the users, understanding users, uh, building a product that users use. So this is an uh, important traits of uh, software developers. Hey, thanks for that, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, I will also add from my personal perspective, some good habits are, well, if you're new to software development, I think the first thing is to read a lot of code, right? And, I guess you probably read more code than you write code. So I think good habit to develop is that you should write readable code. Right? So have a, have that ego to write code that reads like a book. You know, that people look at your code and say, "Wow, this is this is so easy to understand." Right? So that I think that is sort of a paradigm that you should maybe start with. Yeah. So, but I think you should read more code. Uh, try to understand the language that you are passionate in, the programming language. What's the idiomatic style that people adopt? Right. Uh, look at the look at the look at the articles. Look at the the, the websites, the, the language guides, the language specifications. Uh, go deep a little deeper lah, on the on the particular language, right? and that's on the programming aspect. Right. So writing readable code and other good habits I can share is probably um, um, around practicing lah, Right. I think you should allocate time to practice and uh, no, go a bit deeper and, and uh, try to always constantly improve or refactor. Mm. So I think that's something that's maybe should be a habit to keep improving even in old codes. So, yeah. um, so I do want to pause a bit here. I know we have a breakout session. I think there are various questions triggering in. I suggest maybe we don't do the breakout since the breakout is also for us to do more intimate um uh, question and answer uh if the audience here don't mind we can stay put with the q a and uh take this till the end of the day which is around 5 20 right and we take call it a close uh how does it sound to everyone yeah okay Thanks for that. Some responses. So let, let's let's do that. Uh, okay. I think there are some good questions triggering in uh, from Ching Huang also. Well, which is one programming language we can learn that provides the most software development job opportunity? Okay, this one I have to turn to maybe Kendrick, who knows ten programming languages, <laughs> to give his insights a bit. Uh, okay. Uh, my personal view is uh, C plus plus. I think that's uh, maybe the most complicated one to. Master la. So once you master every single uh, feature or whatever elements of C++, I think the rest of the languages just, just borrow a subset of it or maybe simply just uh, enhance a little bit here and there. Even for example, once you know C, C, C++, then you know a bit of assembly, then uh, maybe assembly is no longer uh, active in the market anymore, I think for majority of the, majority of the people. But uh, I think Java syntax actually evolved from C++. Then C sharp also evolved from C plus plus. Then uh, whatever scripting language, uh, uh, scripting languages like Perl, Python, all these are all evolving around C plus plus. It's just that it uh, becomes uh, easier to use, uh, more more efficient, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the from the time to market lah, right? So maybe if you use C plus plus, maybe you need one month, but maybe other languages because it's easier to code, you only need to spend one week. Yeah, so, but the efficiency of the code is another uh, side of the thing, right? Yeah. Okay. And uh, maybe in relation to uh, language versus job opportunity, uh, any, uh, any uh, reactions from the panel? Yeah. Any inputs on that perspective? Okay, um, maybe start with me. Uh, so, based on the current demand right now uh, for NCS, I think Java is still predominantly uh, uh, having this kind of strong needs. Uh. Then I think Java, then uh, followed by .NET. Then for the low code, like up systems, Pega, all this uh, will be a small percentage. I think this are uh, based on what I can see. Yeah, I'm not sure about other industries. Okay. Anything to add from the rest? Uh, 
Swim team, Jonathan or Andy? Yeah, uh, so I think uh, what the speaker mentioned about uh, no code. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. so I, I, I just like, you know, introduce to everyone about this uh, Google product called App Sheets. Uh, so this is uh, something new that uh, Google has built uh, that basically, uh, you know, allow uh, users to build a uh, code, you know, without, you know, with very minimum coding. So I think uh, if you are not too sure exactly, uh, you know, in what kind of role you are really want to get into, like, you know, first understanding, uh, you know, how the, you know, how, how the whole software development methodology works, right? Looking at things like, no, uh, you know, using very minimal code, like app sheet or no code. So this will give you a good feel of uh, the whole entire process of building a product, you know, with software. And then once you identify your passion, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, whether it's front end, back end, full stack, uh, in, or in a specific area like uh, big data, uh, blockchain. So, so that will give you uh, like a taste uh, so that to, you can see for yourself whether this is something suitable, right? Then before you identify that, that specific area that you want to go into. Yeah, because subsequently that will require uh, more investment in terms of your time and effort. Uh, you know, all the time hope, you know, you should be enjoying what you, what are you actually uh, learning and also, uh, you know, the role that you want to get to. Okay. Thanks for sharing, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, well, I think job opportunity is quite subjective, but it depends on the market and also the type of company. So in, in enterprise or maybe more governmental uh, companies, uh, Java is still quite predominant. If you go to startups, uh, I think most young people doesn't know Java too much. Yeah, I mean they teach, but they probably don't practice it. Yeah, so you can look at Ruby. Some people, some of them do a lot of Ruby. Uh, Golang is also picking up. Yeah, so I think this these are some of the languages that startup use. Okay. Um, I would like to maybe skip ahead, and then there's one question also from Daryl. I think this is an interesting one. From a hiring perspective, right? What will be your ideal, right? Meet career candidate. How does he or she look like to you, right? And uh, maybe this is a question with Andy and maybe Kendrick. Uh, uh, what, what, from a perspective, uh, what's the ideal meet career candidate look like for you? Right? Okay, uh, I, I start first. Uh, okay, I think as mentioned earlier, we look at the attitude uh, of the candidate, uh, eager to learn, uh, eager to adapt, and able to analyze the, the problem. Uh, uh, in a systematic way, la, right? So, so this is the bare minimum quality that we are assessing. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I think Kendrick has mentioned just now we don't look for programming ability for for us to employ to to look for network engineers. We also don't look for the ability. It's good to have that, nonetheless. But mid career switch, we cannot expect that. La. So what we look for is really personality, attitude, and persistence. You no. Know? Because when you make a big change mid-career, uh, we are also judging you based on how persistent you are with this decision. Yeah, that I think is main for us. Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Kendrick and Andy. All right, let me uh, see. Can I jump on to that question? So, uh, yes. uh, Daryl here. So I hear that um, you all say you're based on the willingness to learn. So. How would someone demonstrate this to you in an interview? First, um, I've, I'm, I'm part of E2I, and so we get a lot of people who say they're willing to learn. And then, but how would, what are signs that shows that the person is willing to learn? Because um, if a person has to do some projects, I understand that that person may be persistent. But someone who has not done something like that, what would be some signs uh, that shows that they're open to learning? Yeah. Maybe I jump in first. Uh. When you look at the profile of the candidates, sometimes from the profile, you can see that they actually try out a lot of things, try out different roles, or even have uh, multiple disciplines uh, from different uh, industry or different expertise. So that could be a sign of they are actually learning a lot of things. Uh, yeah, that's maybe part of the assessment. Yep, uh, following up on what Kendrick has mentioned. Uh, so first thing is looking at his profile. Uh, so I think just now there was a question, uh, we switch career, switch roles every three years. Uh. Uh, I would say that that is a good practice, not necessarily everybody needs to do that, but Kendrick has, I think, shifted within the company itself, okay? 
So it's it's all right. I have also changed roles every three to four years. Uh, Jonathan knows this very well. So this is very important uh, that you are continuously learning. Okay, not say that's not necessary that if you stay in a role, you're not learning. I'm not meaning that way, but it shows a sign, first thing. Second thing is during the interviews, we will ask you for particular cases that you think hey, you are really learning. And what do you get from that? So from this our conversation, we can tell whether you are really uh, sincere and it's really real, you no, know, something like that. You no, know, we, we have to access. Thirdly, some of the interviews we set scenarios. Okay, you have to say what do you think of this scenario? What is your reaction? So from the conversation of the reaction and uh, pros and cons, we can also tell. These are some of the interview techniques uh, that we use. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Mm, for the answer to the question. Okay, let me pick out another question from here. There's a, also from Dara, maybe uh, just to close it off, uh, the last question uh, that you posted uh, on burnout, right? Uh, among developers, right? I mean, it's maybe for the guys who are in the industry for a while, uh, including myself, uh, how do we how do we uh, maintain right and last in industry, right? right? So I think Ken, Kendrick and uh, a lot of guys uh, talk about passion, right? How do we maintain the flame right? going for so long? Right? Yeah especially with all the disruption. So any any views on that? Okay, I have my view. Lah. So it's pretty common the burnout happens everywhere, lah. especially the smaller the company, the, the worse it is. Or maybe some part of it. I think just how uh, Shen Ping, right? I think he, he shared about uh, we are too busy. We don't have uh, time to improve our process and so on. I think that, that is real. So um. Why I like Agile so much is because I, I, I think Agile is a, a more human way uh, to do development onwards because it emphasizes a lot on the sustainability of the team. So, so when I was in MD uh, in the past, actually I work uh, from 8 o'clock in the morning all the way until 12 a.m. midnight, you know, continuously for four working days. Then the fifth day, I, I felt sick already. And, uh, and the worst thing was that I was trying to type a, a command to copy a file, but instead I moved a file in Linux system. That means uh, the file was gone, was deleted, and, uh, and there's no recycle bin to recover the file. So that's how uh, silly the thing was. Lah. So when you burn out, even you don't know what you were doing. So, uh, so, so that's why I'm so uh, passionate in Agile to helping uh, different teams or people to do software development in a different way, la, which promotes uh, the human uh, hygiene, la, like how to uh, have a sustainability in the long run and also do it uh, based on the outcomes uh, rather than based on the scope. I, I think a lot of things uh, make sense and also uh, uh, very beneficial to the, the client and also to our people in the long run for software development. Mm, okay, great. Um, maybe I add a bit of perspective. So I think to keep the flame on, uh, like Andy was mentioning, switching roles uh, once in a while helps, right? It gives you some injection of fresh um, energy la, that helps. Uh, you learn new things and uh, you've got steep learning curve again. So I, I think that helps a bit to keep the flame on. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, you must love trends. La, uh, you must be maybe a bit driven uh, to, to know what's coming, right? And keep up with that. Okay, I have one question actually from this, uh, from the attendance submission actually. Uh, maybe this is for shimping uh, for, from, uh, from non-tech to tech, right? So I think I can uh, sort of paraphrase the question a bit like, uh, what was your biggest challenge face uh, uh, when you were picking up programming, right? And um, how do you overcome it? Yeah. Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, okay, I think for myself, um, the biggest challenge I think at the start was, um, I think it was cultural. Um, I think the whole way in which the engineering team work is uh, completely something that I did not encounter before. La. Which is why I say there's uh, the one of the first, it's not just a technical gap, but there's also a cultural gap that you need to close. Um, Depending on the team, of course, you know, if the team is using uh, Agile or something like that, that you 
may not be familiar with. Um, secondly, of course, the technical gap. So this one will take a bit more time because um, if I because for me, I join a team that's already uh, having a product that's quite uh, I mean they've already done quite a lot of the the setup, the code base, and all dependencies, you know, uh, things like that already. So uh, for me, there's a massive code base that I have to get familiar with uh, quickly. Uh, the whole CI CD pipeline was actually already up. So I also had to get familiar with that quickly. Um, all the teams, uh, practices, their tools, um, all of it, I uh, had to close the gap quickly everywhere to, to get independent as quickly as possible. Um, but I would say that um, how I overcome it uh, also has to do a lot with the culture. Um, because in at least in my place, um, uh, we practice pair programming, at least before COVID is uh, easier. Um, the engineers, uh, no matter it's the experienced ones, they'll pair up with maybe less experienced ones uh, to get the newer ones up to speed. Lah. Um, so I would say, although the gap is very big um, and the pace is very fast, but it's supported. Yeah, you're not alone. So I think um, that's how, uh, that's the biggest challenge and how I uh, managed to overcome it with the help of the team also. Yeah. Mm, okay, that certainly helps. Uh. So I guess the culture allows that accelerated learning mm. and the pairing uh, paradigm also accelerated that, uh, to mm. support that. I think that's quite important. So I guess to your earlier point, picking the right company that supports this kind of learning is, uh, is going to help uh, a newbie uh, uh, becoming uh, very experienced very fast. Uh. Yeah. Okay. As, there's actually a related question uh, uh, in in the submission as well, but not on the chat, is uh, how do you find uh, like newbies to find tech mentors, uh, right? How, how can they uh, look out for tech mentors? I, I do want to share a link, which I think is also started by people in, in Singapore. It's, it's a group of techies who started this site, it's uh, Amigos. So it's a site that will try to find tech mentors for, for new guys or newbies. So for those who are keen to look out for tech mentors, you can register yourself uh, on the account there, right? And hopefully you'll find the right person that will coach you. And uh, of course, I think you've got to be a little bit proactive uh, to uh, look for the right mentor on the platform and to help you. Yeah. Okay, I think we have the last three minutes left for today's session. Let me browse through if there's any more questions. Not on the chat. Let me look at the original uh, submission. Right. Um, all right. Mm. Most of them are quite related and sort of answered. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this is a question to uh, is uh, yeah, Jonathan. Right. So uh, there's a question that that was uh, very impressed with the number of certifications that you amassed uh, in a short time. So may, any secret sauce to share? Yeah. Uh, there's no secret sauce. Uh, okay. So, so that, that, that time, uh, during COVID, right. So, uh, this, that, that was also the time that, uh, I really make use of the, you know, sort of downtime, uh, you know, where a lot of the meetings is all, uh, you know, we don't have to do a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. So I think that, that frees up a lot of time. I mean, on the contrary, there's a lot of online meetings, but I think I could still find a bit of time. Uh, during the COVID because uh, there's less travel because during the time I was, uh, you know, I was covering the regional. So I, I do fly a lot, uh, you know, in, a, in ASEAN. So uh, that, that period of time, I, I managed to find some time to like go back to learning. So then I uh, started picking out the books. Uh, so I started with like Udemy. Uh, so I also uh, like, you know, while, while, while actually starting it, uh, I also try, uh, you know, to, a crack at it, uh, you know, doing a lot of hands on, you know, I, I really believe like you know, learning by, by, by actually doing it. Now. So, uh, so that that actually how I actually got started, uh, uh, you know, to you know, because the last division I took, I think it was 2006 or seven, I can't remember, I think it was quite a while back. So, there was like a huge gap that I didn't really, you know, take a certification. Uh, so that COVID time really, like, uh, you know, I really felt that that was the best time I could use to actually to do the study, yeah. So as to how I attain those, I think uh, by, uh, by, you know, first learning something uh, and mastering in one area, like, so I started with AWS, right? So I, I spent a lot of time uh, in AWS. Then once you master the, you know, like, I mean, I'm not really like a true subject matter expert in AWS, so don't, don't, don't get me wrong. So I'm able to at least understand, you know, to a certain degree, uh, 
like you know how things work there. So from there, you know, I think the knowledge that I gain uh, is able to apply laterally to other environments like you know Azure. Then I I think that help helps me a lot. Lah. So I always believe like you know being able to learn something that you can then uh, you know do a lateral move into discovering new things. So I think that would be the best time, uh, best way of learning. Yeah. But of course, if you identify something that you're really passionate in, right? So things like blockchain, right? So blockchain is blockchain really, um, you know, you, you can't really, you know, take the knowledge and apply into things like, like CICD, for example, right? So I, I think, uh, you know, if you identify an area that you are very passionate in, then I would recommend you just go for it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I do think certification is also a very rigorous uh, channel uh, where you can uh, get the fundamentals sorted. Uh, right. So, yeah. yeah, I think I think certification part uh, allows you to do that quite well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay, we have come to the end uh, of the Q and A. I hope many of you have benefited from today's talk, and it was worth your time uh, staying here now and uh, talking to the panel. And I'd like to thank the speakers uh for spending the time here and also andy for spending the time here and answering your question and uh, scs and e2i for organizing this uh for the community and in closing um so i think uh some key takeaways at least for me uh, today is that um, i mean choices today are, are, are a lot more complex uh, 10 20 years ago a lot more simpler right you're you are either a java camp or dotnet camp right yeah so so and then before that, it's bus bus, uh, not so much complicated stuff, right? And then there was no CI/CD. I mean, I mean, there were Maven and there was and stuff like this and N, uh, I mean, no N. It's not so complicated, yeah. So these days, uh, you learn you, you as a developer, knowing programming language is probably just uh, one quarter of the equation. Uh, you need to learn no CI/CD as well. So yeah, but I think the key is that you you can't learn everything under the sun. Uh, so I think pick one that you're passionate with, stay focused, go deep. And uh, and and uh, beyond the strong fundamentals, right? Yeah. And um, I think uh, on trends uh, in closing, I would think there are some no regret trends that's already happening and will be probably mainstream. Cloud native is already here to stay for sure, right? Um, so cloud will be here to stay. Uh, data, there will only be more data, not less data. So getting areas into data processing, um, data engineering. Uh, branching out to ML, I think those are non-regret trends. Uh, right? And of course, machine learning, right? And a lot of things have already been solved uh, in machine learning, object detection and all these things. And I don't think you need to write and train new things from scratch. A lot of the algos are already developed. On the cloud, there's also auto ML, right? So I think machine learning is uh, is a no, no return trend. Right? I think you should learn the fundamentals and how it works. And also blockchain, I think with the web 3.0, the ownership web, I think, is a very interesting paradigm. Uh, I think we should watch that space. I think it's, it's probably inevitable. We would have Web 3.0, right? So uh, good trends to look at and uh, keep ourselves, I mean, relevant. Okay. And uh, with that, I think I will close the session for today. Thank you all for coming. I hope it's been time well spent. <laughs>